ask for that one. I hope. Oh, look at that. Mm -hmm. Time having arrived, I call the meeting of the Standing Committee on Finance to order for today, May 20th, 2019. Uh, I wanted to make sure that it said, I said 2019 because I think last week I said 2017. <laughs> uh, wishful thinking, but what are you going to do? Uh, and I just want to welcome everybody to the chambers. I have just a couple things before we go on. I received a call from Council Monaghan that he's stuck at work and can't be here. Council Nicastro is at a graduation for her son and will not be here as well. And I did receive a phone call from the Executive Director of the Elections Commission stating that she has a, a water emergency at home oh, and no. cannot be here as well. With that being said, Councillor Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to make a motion that I don't usually make, but after 42 years of service to the people of Brockton and the students of Brockton, I thought it would be okay if we made a motion to take item number 13, which would be the last item of the evening. It's a resolve concerning the school department. Uh, outgoing uh, superintendent of schools, Kathy Smith, I'd like to make a motion to move that to number Second. one. Second. Motion has been made and second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Sure. Madam Superintendent, you're up. Thank you. Was that, was that your line? Yeah. Oh, what, what, go ahead. <laughs> Resolved that the superintendent of schools and such other staff as she may designate be invited to a finance committee meeting in May 2019 to provide an updated overview of funding, staffing, and educational equity issues for Brockton school population. Invited Kathleen Smith, superintendent of Brockton schools. Madam Superintendent, welcome. Good evening, you Councilor. That these ladies are keeping us in line. That's and she turned around, she goes, what are you doing? <laughs> but welcome. I've had that happen during school committee yep. meetings also. <laughs> so I understand. Thank you so much for having me this evening. And as I look back over the six years uh, as superintendent, one of the things that became very clear to me early on uh, during, I think, my first budget cycle was when we came before you, it really didn't offer an opportunity. You had so many questions, as you should, about what happens in the Brockton Public Schools, our wonderful school district with almost 17,000 youngsters, that what we did after that first year was we put together every year what I call the State of the Schools Address. And I thank you, and I think the first thing I have, and I will bring your attention to the State of the Schools booklet, which certainly has grown over the years. So I'm obviously not going to read this to you. I would <laughs> like you to take the time to read not only the superintendent's message, the deputy, all our facilities, um, our bilingual department, special education, office of teaching and learning, office of student support. Every one of our schools is in here. And the other thing that this is not just a feel good book, we have lots to feel good about in the Brockton Public Schools, but I want you to know that this is about successes and it's also about the challenges that have been insurmountable that we have obviously faced the past six years, I would say. Mm -hmm. So I'll be referencing this. You also have a packet that has in there um, some information on what we call a deck of gross inequities. I'll explain that. You're going to see some newspaper articles and some testimony that I gave before the Joint uh, Commission uh, on Education at the State House <laughs> on March 22nd. So let me first begin by also, when I mention kind of the differences from six years ago, I wanna thank you because when I came on board, one of my professional goals was to make sure that we had strong collaboration, not just with my wonderful school committee, who has certainly been there every step of the way, and I know you know it isn't just school committee meetings, it's finance meetings, it's policy meetings, it's advocacy meetings, and they're out there day and night, whatever I have needed in these six years during very trying times. We also made sure that city council was part of that collaboration. I remember my first year when we were talking about facilities, we actually, if some of you remember, had a bat bus that took us around to visit some of the schools and some of the concerns we had about facilities. We've been before you about technology. We've been before you certainly every year about our budgets. And I thank you because you have been a strong partner. You're out there advocating, and I know how much you care about the children in the community, and most specifically the Brockton Public Schools. Um, I am not here really this evening to talk about the budget, although I want to make a couple of things really clear. We did settle our teacher contract, so we have a three-year contract in effect, and what this is allowing us to do as we settle other contract is to stabilize the district. I don't think I have to remind you that two years ago, 
we had a daunting $16.9 million budget deficit. I talk about having received a call from the commissioner, who at that time was a receiver in the Lawrence Public Schools, anticipating in his next year also uh, into the thousands of dollars budget cuts. And I remember, and I remind him of this, remembering him calling me and saying, how did you handle a $16.9 million deficit? Nobody should have to do that. Mm -hmm. Nobody should have to dismantle a, a wonderful, excelling public school system. Two years ago, we had an $11 million deficit. I came before you. And this year, and I wanna make it clear, because although the paper accurately reports that we did not lay off not only any teacher, but any member of any of our bargaining units <clears throat> or any member of the Brockton Public Schools. Because with a $5.6 million deficit, we saw this as moving in the right direction and an opportunity to stabilize this district. Where we are right now is we are obviously watching what's happening in uh, the State House with the House budget, the Governor's budget, the Senate budget, so that will not be decided till probably sometime after July 31st. So I just wanna make sure everybody understands that although we did not lay off anybody, we are still facing a budget deficit. My hope is, and when you hear me talk about the advocacy, I know many of you know what has gone on. It is uh, eons from where I was a year ago, and I'm very, very pleased, and I cannot thank this council enough. Because when I came to you a couple of years ago and I spoke to the mayor, and I said, we need to actually put together some funding because if we are going to move forward, not that we want to move forward with an equity in education lawsuit, but we want to make sure that the right things happen for our youngsters, you certainly came to the plate and did what we had to do to move us forward. And I'll talk about the things we've been able to do. So thank you for that. But again, I'm not here to really talk about the budget this evening. I can answer a few questions you may have, but understand that those are kind of moving pieces right now. I'm gonna talk about our facility department, and again, all of this is in the book. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Thomas, soon to be your interim superintendent, and I am so pleased, um, said to me today, he said, you know what, Kathy? He said, we worked so hard this past year. When we get into the months of June, and e believe it or not, the months of September, and even today in May, the buildings heat up, and not every building is air conditioned. But he was able to go out with our facility crew and about 167 additional classrooms, we now have air conditioners in so our teachers can focus on instruction, our children can come in and have buildings that are at least appropriated with air conditioners to be able to weather so-called the day. Also, I have to tell you, last August, and I never say this, with all our challenges, but I was at East Middle School for a celebration at the end of the summer with one of our leadership academies. And I sat in East Middle School Auditorium, a school I loved, I taught there for almost 10 years, a really important school to me. And it was the first time that I felt like I was in a rundown urban school. You take a look at that auditorium. There were seats that were torn out because we didn't have the money to replace them. So I am so proud, and you'll see this in your facility book, that again, our facility department under Deputy Superintendent Thomas were able to come up with our own manpower and changed out those seats. And it looks like a wonderful auditorium that you'd want to graduate students or invite the public in for you know, a drama or a play or a musical performance. So again, we continue to do a whole lot more with less as we struggle with uh, our facilities. Also, um, I want to thank the Deputy Superintendent for putting in a statement of interest with North Middle School a year ago. We talked to you about closing that down within a year and applying for math school building assistance. Hopefully that becomes your first middle school junior high that you're able to not only renovate, possibly build a STEM wing. So we have put in a proposal and are very hopeful that that will be one of our first schools. You know that I stood here a year ago and I know that it was funny for some when I called out not calling Brockton High School the new Brockton High. I'm gonna stand before you again, and I know right now you are facing some critical decisions. I certainly have watched what's been in the newspaper. And as I stand here, a resident, a longtime resident of Brockton, not just your superintendent, I have to tell you how much I agree in this day and age with a new public safety facility for our police and our fire department. I couldn't agree more. And we as a community need to support that. But as I stand here as superintendent, I also do not think we pit each group against another mm -hmm. because I do represent over 17,000 students, 4,200 of them that are not voters at this time but will soon become your voters. And they deserve whatever we have to do as a community to pay attention to Brockton High School and what needs to be done for these children. 
I had an intern, an administrative intern, sit with me on Friday. And she became very emotional. I've known this intern for a long time. And I was very surprised that she was this emotional. And she was telling me a story of coming from a South Shore town that has just invited the public to come in. They're building a new high school. People were also questioning, like we are, the kinds of finances. And she shared with me a story about people coming for a recital and going into Brockton High School and talking about how run down it looked and how it broke her heart. She got very emotional. I'm very emotional. Take a walk through Brockton High School. Take a look at the rugs that have had to be pulled up, the cement on the floors, the outdated AV or, or technology equipment that we have. And I don't want to take away from our facility department because I can't tell you the excellent work that they're doing. When you look around and you see what our craftsmen are able to do with, a, think about a 50-year-old building and thousands and thousands of kids that have walked through those halls. We are doing everything we can, and it's, it's not a dirty building, not by any means. It is just a very aged building that needs a lot of attention. So again, I, I know that you know when I came on as superintendent, when I interviewed, one of the first things I talked about was a facility master plan. You've done that. You have a facility master plan. It outlines every one of our schools and what needs to be done. And I do hope with your wisdom, when you look back in 1960s with the building of the so-called New Brockton High School, it took a lot of people with a lot of foresight and a lot of courage to say to the people in our community, a very blue collar community, and I've told the story before, we built a high school for $16.3 million, which was more money than we could afford as a blue collar community. And you look at the years and years and years and how proud we are of that high school campus. Um, let me go on to the equity and education lawsuit. I am very, very pleased or action. So when I came before you last year, we had had a number of meetings and I'm just gonna quickly, quickly go through so you can see the work that has happened. When I left you last year, we had met with the city of Worcester in what we call the tale of two cities at the time. Mm -hmm. We then met with Secretary of State Pizer back in May of 2018 and visited three of our schools, Brockton High, North Middle, and Raymond. We then went to Western Mass at Holyoke on, I believe it was October 9th, with Holyoke, Springfield, Worcester, and Brockton and presented the tale of four cities, talking again about the challenges for each and every one of us in our budget. And also what we were doing, and I know you know this, we were building <coughs> coalitions across the state for people to come on board and not just be Brockton out there by themselves. In January, we went to Greater Boston, Aldo Petronio, who has been beside me every step of the way. I couldn't be prouder than my chief financial officer for the work that he has done, not only to support what's happening in Brockton and to tell our story, but to tell stories throughout the state with other mayors and business managers and superintendents. In Greater Boston, we headed up the panel, Aldo and myself, along with superintendents, mayors from Chelsea, Malden, Revere, Salem, Lynn, all at the same time it was going on in New Bedford and going on in Fitchburg and all their surrounding communities. We had our own forum on March 18th, some of you attended, Equity and Education Now. On the 22nd, you will see my testimony you're only given three minutes, even I can't talk that fast, but you'll be able to see what we did on March 22nd with sharing the testimony. And I wanna point out, when we look at some of the wealthier communities, and Brockton is spending a little over a dollar on materials and supplies to the tune of over $200 in a wealthier community, and I love the line in there that's, that says, they should because they can. And we need to be able to do the same thing when you're talking about equity for all students. We then went on to meet with Attorney General Mara Healy on April 11th, a very eye-opening meeting. And let me describe what that is like because as I go through the ending of what has happened this year, we have a coalition of a consultant working with us and that's a thanks to Brockton of uh, Trip Jones, who I know some of you I believe have met, who is heading up as our consultant pulling everybody together. After we did those presentations, we have three big law firms doing pro bono work. We have John Albano from Morgan and Lewis. We have uh, Mike Angelini out of Worcester and Boston from uh, Bowdrich and Dewey. And we have Patrick Moore who came to me from uh, former Secretary of Education Paul Revel during Ed Reform in the early 90s. Patrick Moore worked for the Obama administration, Deval Patrick administration. He is um, in Hemingway and Barnes and excellent attorneys representing us right now. When we went before the Attorney General, 
Not only did they have these three attorneys, but also members from their firm, the workers, sitting there with the attorneys. The attorney general was there with probably eight members of her staff listening to, in your packet, you have what I call our deck. It's all of the research that was done on the communities of Brockton, New Bedford, uh, and Worcester. And we have a Harvard uh, graduate student, doctoral student, who actually put together and worked with us to make sure that we had that information. So when we went before the Attorney General, or when we had the press briefing on May 8th, or when we went before the uh, Boston Globe editorial board, all of that information is there. And when you look back a year ago, this is not me coming before you and talking the talk. It's exactly what is happening now for Brockton. So we're watching our own uh, state senators, representatives, governor, and we're telling them that if you don't do the right thing and make sure that every child from our state constitution has an adequate education, we do not want to go with a lawsuit. But we are well poised to do what we have to do for the children in Brockton and children all over this commonwealth. Um, when you talk about technology and testing, I came to you a year ago and I talked about the stresses when you talk about 2019 and online testing at Brockton High School. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 515,000 approved by the mayor and the city council for uh, additional laptops. I think over 1,100 additional laptops for our students. And it made a difference. It made a difference with one-to-one -one devices for just about grades three through eight. We're working at the high school, and what that did is when it came testing time, in a wealthier district, the students have their one-to-one -one devices. We were rolling laptop cots around, taking a lot of time for testing, time away from instruction, and we are not having to do that. We're not exactly what we need, where we need to be, but we're certainly moving in the right direction because of the action of our city and saying that our kids uh, are important to us and will do whatever we have to do. We did have a challenge this past year, and I know you're aware of it in November. We had a, a virus that hit all of our um, systems in the Brockton Public Schools. We had to upgrade. We had to provide additional security measures because when this takes down a school system, and goodness knows how our Director of Technology, Dan Vigent, and his staff got through this with the help of many more people coming on board. When we lifted our head, it had over a $500,000 price tag. And when you're running on a shoestring budget, those are the things that cannot happen. We're very fortunate for all of us that we had uh, a very light winter this winter. We also have more complex passwords for our students. They'll be using cards to actually, we can't expect little kindergartners and first grades, graders to understand the complexity of passwords. So we have cards where they're able to long, log on with just a swipe of a card. Nice. But we're also looking at when you bring in additional technology, there needs to be instructional coaches for training for the teachers. There needs to be uh, opportunities for servicing the um, technology that you bring on board. So this is a department that is growing. And as we move forward, hopefully those are the things that we're going to be able to do. We have seven schools in turnaround. And what does that mean? We have a new accountability system. What that means, again, in a district like Brockton, we are seeing the effects of a broken foundation formula at this point. When you have class sizes in kindergarten of 27 youngsters sharing a paraprofessional and your neighbors have 20 students and a paraprofessional in every one of their classrooms. When you have classes that have outdated reading programs and you're finally able to bring it on a grade level at a time and this year finally having K to five reach for reading research based making sure our teachers have the best materials possible as we transition to common core as we look at our curriculum we actually have John Hopkins University in our district doing an audit. One of the things you'll see, I think, in one of the newspaper articles, and this is true, when you look at our social studies books at the high school, when we don't have 9-11 in the social studies books, that's a problem. So again, these are things that we're going to do as we start to hopefully have more money infused into our district wh whatever way possible. We are focusing on instruction, instructional materials, and technology for our students. Um, district accomplishments. I'm so proud of the George School. We are now a global study school. So many of you knew we had the UNTO Spanish dual language program there. We now have the UNIDOS Portuguese program and we have the Armitier French program. One of its kind in this state. We're little kindergartners and we're growing it each year are coming on board to create a global study school. 
So very proud of the work happening there. We also have a Portuguese exchange teacher here from Portugal, uh, a young man teaching our, our little kindergartners at the George School. So these are ways that we're opening up our doors and looking at the community that we are. Um, our, when I talk about, again, uh, challenges, our English language learners are growing in our community and we continue to need the proper staffing and make no mistake about it. When we have the proper teaching, when we have the materials, when we have the staffing, those children are able to soar. Communication, we're gonna be having a Choose Brockton campaign because I can't imagine choosing any other school for your child in the Brockton Public Schools. And I look at you, I know many of you have students from your own families that have been graduates of Brockton High School. We have a graduate coming up, I think, in, in just another short week. And you know the wonderful things that we are able to offer. So it's about time that we start marketing. We probably haven't had to do that for years and years and years. Times are different when you talk about communication. We need to be out there talking about all the good things happening. Where else can you get, if any of you saw our drama presentation, a Newsies, about a week ago, you would think that you are on Broadway. It is just amazing to me what we do with the music, with the arts, with our AP programs, our advanced placement, our international baccalaureate programs. You won't get that anyplace else, and it's time for us to start to open the doors and make sure that people are choosing us over other districts or certainly uh, any other option that they have. Um, we're looking at community schools, and we're looking for the community schools of the future. No more, and I can remember studying this, many of you know Harry Allen, and I can remember he and I talked about Brockton High School when it opened, and I've told you there wasn't a parking spot to be had there in the evening because people came out to do evening programs. That's not what's happening anymore. But community schools is growing. They're meeting, they're having retreats, they're talking about action plans. You know, where do we go from here? And I want to leave you with one story. As you make decisions about new things that come into the city of Brockton, never forget that way back, I remember Mayor Jack Units tapped me on the shoulder and said, come with me, it was a cold March day. And we went up to Brockton High School where the state pool was there, the Manning Pool, and at the time, the state didn't want to run the pool anymore. And the mayor said to me, because he knew what community schools was all about, we continually had grants put in there, and whatever you gave us, we were able to benefit the entire Brockton community. And I will tell you, I'll never forget being excited about taking over the pool. We had great lifeguards, kids doing swimming. I saw that as such a plus. And I remember being pushed back and being told by the school department or a person in the school department that, that we weren't in the pool business. Well, you know what? We were in the pool business. We took over that pool as a city and a collaboration with the schools. You now make sure that we train lifeguards for places all over the city so our kids are safe. Not only do we use it for every one of our programs in the Brockton Public Schools, special needs kids, wonderful opportunities for our students in every one of our camp programs. And in the afternoon, we open it up to the public. Councilor Rodriguez, you were right there with me and you know exactly what I'm talking about back then. Mm -hmm. So I hope you keep open minds as you look at facilities and understand what community schools can offer you going forward. We need to expand our Chapter 74 programs, which are your vocational college and career programs. <coughs> These are things that we will certainly be able to do. We have excellent staffing. Um, we also, I wanna bring up in our um, School Registration Parent Information Center, when we ran into our direct certification a couple of years ago, and I'll remind you that over 4,500 students fell off the rolls because they weren't on a certified state program. SNAP, food stamps, you know, mass health. Those were things that supposedly qualified students for low income and additional money so that we're able to support them in the schools. So what we did was we went out and hired, we had already actually hired Janice Johnson Plumer, who has done an excellent job meeting with our parents when they come to register students. She is now actually certified by the Department of Transitional Assistance to be an off-site uh, place where people can sign up if in fact they are uh, able to qualify for benefits. That benefits our families if they need and it also benefits our children that are then uh, certified as low income as they well should have been. Um, for our special education, I wanna tell you a quick story there. We are very inclusive, we integrate, we have excellent special education programs and I wanna tell you I had a parent reach out to me Friday night, I was in the office and I really became very emotional reading a, a speech that this young man who was going to be graduating from Brockton High School wrote. I'm not sure if he's been selected as the salutatorian of the class, which is somebody that has chosen to give the speech, but when I look at what this young man wrote, he's autistic, 
and he talked about at Brockton High School how people included him. Didn't matter if it was members of the football team, cheerleaders that included the freshmen at their lunch tables so no child would eat alone. You know, being able to be part of a unified sports opportunity. You know, teachers that supported him. He is graduating on time with his class. And that story is just one story when you talk about the programs that we put in place. I'll go to the prom this Thursday night. It'll be my last senior prom. <laughs> and I say that because when I go there and I see every student, it doesn't matter if you're a student special education with a disability, when they're out on that dance floor dressed beautifully, having the time of their lives, that's what's going to matter many years later, that they were included. And I can't thank our staff enough <coughs> and our students at Brockton High School for making sure that that happens for all students. Um, I talked about Brockton High School, again, all that has to offer. Our biotech and sciences, awards all around for our teachers and our students. You have 275 John and Abigail Adams scholarship winners this year. That's over $7,000 per student in scholarship if they go to a state institution. And that makes a difference for certainly many of our kids to have that entry point. Talked about the drama and the arts, talked about athletics. This year we always talk about you know, soccer and football. We actually had a track team, a four by 400. All states qualified for the new uh, balance invitational in New York City. Coach Bob Bowen, varsity basketball, named Northeast Coach of the Year. When you look at our food services department, we offer free breakfast and lunch to every one of our students. Not only is it a free breakfast, if there's something left over, every child has a snack. Less visits to the nurse, you know, more time spent on learning and being focused, and it's the right thing to do to support our youngsters. And I'm going to finish with this. I look at our Raymond School when we talk about accountability and some of the challenges we've faced. A number of years ago, the Raymond School was looked at by the state as poss possibly a school that would have been called level four at the time. Well, they weren't going to let that happen. Not only did they turn the school around by taking a look at building culture, climate, instructional practices, everything that makes a school a high achieving school. And the students there are no different than any students across the district, which is why I'm always hopeful that when we are put to the test and we face challenges, we rise above those. They defied their odds, they knocked it out of the park with that test this year and did an excellent job with our K-5 to school. And that's just one school. We certainly had others, but I wanna call that out. So thank you uh, for this opportunity to share with you the state of the Brockton Public Schools. Obviously, I would be here all night if you wanted me to go school by school and talk about the wonderful things happening. I know you don't want that to happen, but um, this has meant a lot to me. Uh, the city has, has meant a lot to me, and again, I couldn't be prouder, and I say this to the kids all the time, than being the superintendent of the Brockton Public Schools. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Cruz uh, neglected to say something in the beginning when he said that you were you're, you're spending this is your 42nd year in the uh, in the system. I think he forgot to mention that you started when you were 10. <laughs> That's correct. I said nine actually when I talked to her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, folks, do you have any questions for the superintendent, uh, Councillor Azak? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, it's not a question. I just would like to thank you personally. I've seen you in the past um, six years since I've been up here as a city councilor, and you were always fighting for our students, and it um, made me very proud to have you as our superintendent. So thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor uh, Ian Eyre. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, good evening again, uh, Madam Superintendent. And um, I could talk long, too, if I had to because you and I could uh, reminisce back to um, the beginning of those uh, late 70s, early 80s and what the Brockton school system went through and um, a lot of um, staff members, some have gone now, but, but those that uh, haven't and are still you know, with us can uh, still uh, you know, appreciate the fact of uh, how far we've come in, in such a long, long time because we had difficult years, but you were there and you, s and you stuck it out with, with um, a lot of people um, and we had a lot of layoffs and we had a lot of, a lot of things that didn't, you know, weighed well and, and, and looked positive for us as, as we went ahead, but they did. We had some ups and downs, but um, I have to say that uh, 
you know, fortunately, even the last few years, there's, there's been, I think, more ups than downs, and, and that's going to happen even beyond your time, I'm sure, as being a superintendent. We all, we all know that, but um, I do want to say uh, thank you for your uh, many years of, of service, um, not only you, even your, even your husband for many years of, of service as well. It was always great when it came to negotiations, and, and he was on that other side, and I was on this side, mm -hmm. but he, uh, he always waited in the best interest of, of mm -hmm. the city, the children, and, and the staff that he was there to represent. And, uh, and you've done the same thing for these past two, you know, years as, uh, you know, a few years as superintendent of schools, and, and it's been a great pleasure to work with you. And, and just want to say to you, um, since I'm somewhat semi-retired, um, retirement is good. It is, it is, it is good. Um, you'll learn that, but I know you're going to stay involved. So that's the most important thing. We're going to see you and, and appreciate that you're going to, you know, want to keep moving us forward as yes. well. And uh, and congratulations too to the interim superintendent who will be coming in, Mike Thomas, to 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 take your spot for for this point in time. But good job, well done. Appreciate it very very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Borgar. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, thank you, Superintendent, for being here. And first of all, I know you could come on all night with all the successes and certainly all the challenges. It's very interesting how you can have both. And um, as far as the state of the schools, am I to understand that people could find this online or ha receive some hard yep. copies? It's, it's hot off the press, but we will. We brought it to you this evening. Um, the school committee received it over the weekend and we will get it up as quickly as we can. Okay, thank you. That wasn't, you know, to rush it, but I just oh, want no, people no. to realize how much really goes into all this and how important it is. And I know you don't get the chance to mention all the programs, Adult Learning Center, for example, and all the, what's going on there. But I just have, th that was the other question I want to ask you. On the handheld devices, it, how many more do you need to have everyone have one? You're, talking the, you're talking the laptops. Yes, yeah, yes. That, yeah. um, I'm looking back, um, but another 3,000 it looks another like. Another 3,000, okay. And now just, I mean, because it seems like that's something manageable and it seems that everyone benefits. So uh, both both the, the students and the staff and certainly they go on with their challenges. But I, that, that was, I was curious about that. And uh, I wanted to thank you very much for this evening. And I'm very excited about, um, how would I say it, the future of the schools. And you certainly, how would I say it, were responsible for a remarkable and uh, strong foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor Dorenacourt. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's so nice to see you, Superintendent. As you know, um, whenever we talk about education, uh, it's something that always uh, touched me deep. And um, after 40 years of serving, uh, our wonderful city. I mean that our wonderful city. Uh, it is amazing to see uh, what uh, we are about to do and what we can do. And um, thank you for talking about um, equity for all students. As you were talking, I took a lot of notes, but I know that you mean every single word that come out of your of your mouth. And you also talk about um, when we have proper staff, our students do have the ability to saw. That's something that's very important. And I know that firsthand, education is something that children truly deserve and your unwavering commitment and ability and capacity not only to reach within our city but also to talk to our uh, state and also federal leaders truly an amazing thing that we have in this city your service to our city if not the commonwealth of massachusetts will be truly missed but as you know personally um, as we're about to move to the next uh, next thing to whatever you want to do one thing that I will ask you, don't give up on our children. And I know you will never give up on them. You may not be the superintendent, but the knowledge that you have about the school system, your ability to bring our teachers, our um, local leaders, and our state leaders is something that I strongly believe that the next superintendent will truly need. And because of that, I thank you not only for myself, but on behalf of every single child that we have in this city. Believe it or not, you've done something amazing that this city will never forget, and I thank you for that. Thank you, Councilor. I, I wanna make it clear, and I know you know this. You know, I have behind me an executive team, many of them sitting here this evening. I mentioned Aldo Petronio, June Saber McGuire, who has a job as uh, Chief Academic Officer for all of our schools. You know, Tom Minicello, my Vice Chair on the School Committee. It hasn't been easy. You know, it's, it's a relationship that you develop. We have had a lot of challenges. Um, I always know that every decision that he makes and our school committee makes, they do make, as you said, Councillor, in the best interest of every one uh, of our students. 
and you heard me say I, I couldn't be prouder. The deputy has been a supporter. Um, he has been a thought partner, and I know that he will lead this district and continue to, you know, we've laid the groundwork. None of us are going away. So we do this as a team. I consider you part of the team. I think the mayor has done an excellent job out there with the mayors from New Bedford and Worcester. You know, I'm proud when all of us, and if you look back in 93, it's amazing that the governor came together and your uh, Speaker of the House, you know, your Senate President, businesses came together to do the right things to do, and thank goodness the court saw it our way in the McDuffie case. So it really does take all of us, and, and I hope I was clear in thanking you for, again, you know, being able, we would not have been in the position that we're in right now. We would not have been. And I hope when you look at how far we've come, and we do not want to file an equity and education lawsuit. We want the recommendations from the Foundation Budget Review Commission report. I don't care if they're phased in. I don't care what has to happen, but you must look at that formula. It is broken and it is affecting kids. So thank you, and I appreciate it, but it is truly a, a team effort. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Council Chairman. Um, thank you. You're done? Mm -hmm. Before Councillor Fowell goes, I just also want to acknowledge uh, Judy uh, Sullivan. Oh, I can't see her. <laughs> Anna Pohl, she's a member of the school committee. Uh, welcome. I'm Minna Chong. And Judy has been beside me well before being superintendent Super in my community a, school days. I actually had my little note here to acknowledge uh, Tom Manicello and Judy, uh, but the superintendent kind of beat me to it. <laughs> you know how she is. <laughs> Council Fowler. Thank you isn't adequate for uh, all you've done. I think maybe the best thank you would be if we continue your passion and your devotion mm -hmm. to the the public school. So I just have three or four quick questions, one of which I suspect Mr. Petronio will have to answer. I, I know the answer, but I want my colleagues and the public to know we still are eligible for substantial SBA reimbursement for school projects. Is that correct? Yes, I, I think it's about 80%. It's about 80%. But as I understand it, that doesn't cover design or feasibility. It covers actual construction. Am I right? Everything from soup to nuts, as we would say. Okay. And, and, but that is a program, obviously, that's state-funded, and we hope that it will continue, but one never knows. You know, I was just in Lowell when I, I mentioned, uh, I believe it was in April, we did the uh, Tale of the Cities, and, you know, again, a poor community struggling with their budget. And I want to say it was over $300,000, the high school that they're going to be building. It was interesting because we were in their facility that was opened up in 1980, and then they actually have even an older facility. But, um, but you know, they're going forward, and the talk was, Councillor, the reimbursement figure. It was very hard not to move forward. Now, within the facilities management study, uh, there are a number of different school projects. Have you been asked or has your team been asked to submit perhaps a priority list here of the first one, two, or three that we would like to get done and the, the time sequence in which we would do that. Councillor, are you talking about the facility master plan by Arrow yes. Street? Yes. Um, I don't know if we've prioritized. I know it's all there. Like prioritizing high school uh, right. They, they did they, show you the buildings did. that were in desperate need of repair. Okay. So you, so you do have something in the pipeline for the first two or three that would be done? It's in the report. It, it, but, but how about local? I guess what I'm saying is, has the mayor or I, Mr. Claxon just came on board? Have, have we had administrative lateral communications with you saying, we would like to know what are your top three projects and what are the projected costs and, and the time sequence? Because what I'm gathering is that when you file with SBA, there's like a year's lag time before you hear back. So if you were going to do something in yes. FY20 or 21, you'd almost have to get something in now. We met, I, I want to say I remember meeting in the GAR room when we were actually viewing the report, and they did go over the priorities. But again, it was, it was with all of the information in the facility master plan, not just the schools. Okay. Uh, and we do have a lot Thanks, of schools. Can come up and, and explain some of this stuff? Please. Uh, yeah, so Council Fowell, they... Um, they wanted to prioritize first. They were looking. They were looking at a new school on the south side. Okay. And then and is what, this the consultant? This or was us? the Arrow Street with us. I mean, that was their, they were looking into because that was one of our goals early on was a um, 
either a new middle, uh, probably a new middle school or elementary school on the south side. Um, and then over the last couple of years, our, our enrollment has gone down. So the need for a, a new school in that side of the city is not as, um, you know, as important as it was before because obviously we've lost about 500 students to the New Heights Charter School. Um, so basically we looked at first, basically what the city could afford. That's, so basically North, Brockton High, North and West were the three major schools that they thought needed the most renovations. Um, and then it would follow by East. Um, but you know, Brockton High being a, probably a $350 million renovation project, um, I thought we looked you know, financially to, to go after North first. So that was the first um, statement of interest we put in. I filed that back on April 12th. We should know probably in July, they'll come out and they'll do a site visit and then the board votes whether to accept North into the program and then they'll ask us to enter into a feasibility study with, they're usually about 100,000, a feasibility study for a renovation project. So we would, uh, then they would do the feasibility su study and then they would basically make a decision whether to welcome us into the, to the program. Um, as far as the high school renovation, I know this is something the school committee really wants to take on um, as we go forward. I, I would recommend that between, we should have a joint committee between the school committee and this, uh, the city council to really explore what we should do with the high school. I mean, the city's contribution to that could be anywhere between 60 and 80 million, um, just obviously for a renovation project uh, of that size, for a school that size. You know, Brockton's not like an East Bridgewater or West Bridgewater where they can build the new school in the front or the back of the school while the, the students still attend the old school. Uh, I think the renovation project at the high school would probably be over a five to six year period where they would renovate in sections as the kids could still go to, go to school in one building, renovate another, and then just move the kids around. So um, I, I, I think, you know, a, you know, a few school committee members, a few city councilors going forward as we move along to kind of a joint committee to put our heads together and really plan this out the right way. Uh, because of the, the cost it's gonna to be to the city, I think it has to obviously be done right. But, but that six to 80 would be SBA eligible. Oh yeah, no, basically the, that would be our share oh, of the 20, oh, okay. that would be our 20%. Right. I, you know, that's my guess, the best yeah. guesstimate on looking at other projects across the state. But we'd probably be on the hook for about 60 to 80 million just for the you know, city side money. Um, again, that could be anywhere between a 300 and 400 million dollar renovation project. If they add a STEM wing, and then obviously do over, you know, four academic buildings, the, the fine arts, the gym, the core, um, and then if you add a STEM wing, you, you're looking at, you know, probably anywhere between 300 and 400 million, which would be 60 to 80 million of the cost for the, for the city. Okay, and, and actually that's a segue into my last question, which is, Talk a little bit about the STEM center, the need for it, the need for the kids to be competitive. I understand other communities are already into that, that learning mode and uh, you know, we don't wanna be five or 10 years behind. Uh, yeah. Everywhere we go, they talk about the jobs for the future. And we were just actually in an event last week where our students, it's amazing to me the work they did. They have internships this summer at Forsyth, um, at uh, Dana-Farber. The reason I say that is we were there and there were what, 22 kids that we were able to take into this program. We have the staff willing to go forward. We are having a, a couple of labs up at the high school, but certainly not enough when you talk about 4,200 students at the high school. This is their future. This is where the jobs are. We need to be preparing them for those jobs. So when you look at that 500 page facility master plan report, you know it'll talk about, I think it's off of the Azure, they talk about you know a STEM wing being added there, and when Deputy Superintendent Thomas talks to you about the renovation piece, that also gives you extra space to move the kids if that were to be the first phase of your project. And certainly, you know, allow you know again science, technology, engineering, math. So there are so many things that we just do not have in a 50-year-old high school. And to retrofit it, we have difficulty right now with electrical plugs and you know, wiring and, you know, things that are just aged at this point. Okay, and I guess the last thing I'll say uh, to both of you, particularly since Mr. Thomas is succeeding you, uh, I, I don't view these discussions as one department competing against another. I guess my preference, uh, and I'm partial to the schools, 
because of my family and because of what I've seen them do for so many people. I'd like to see a more holistic approach. I mean, if the city's going to match forward, then look at public education, look at public safety, look at other infrastructures. That way you can go to the chief financial officer and you can say, okay, what are the limits of our bond indebtedness? What can we afford? How, how would SBA uh, affect us? Uh, let's get the applications in because, you know, if you, construction costs are always going to go up. Renovation costs are always going to go up. So instead of doing it piecemeal, that's just my opinion, one out of 11, I would just like to see a more comprehensive, holistic approach to this whole issue. And I think we'd all come out of this really doing something very beneficial for the city. And I hope you understood when I came up here and started that, you know, gone are the days of working in silos. We have very strong relationships with uh, our firefighters, with our police. When you talk about safety and security and training and, you know, they've been to principal meetings, they're in our schools, you know, the relationship is strong. And hence, you know, I started out by saying I come from a firefighting family. You know, uh, being a resident of Brockton, it is important for us to have updated technology and updated services with public safety. So that certainly isn't our goal, and I applaud you for saying that. No, well, you, it, it wasn't you. I, quite frankly, I was trying to save my tail end because some people think I favor the school over public safety, and as you know, public safety has been in my blood. So I, I favor all of it That's in, how a, we in, feel. A, in a cohesive way to go forward and uh, do what we have to do. So uh, that certainly wasn't directed at you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cruz, you started us out. Hold it out. Thank you. I just. Um, oh. <laughs> well, Councillor Sullivan and then Councillor Cruz. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Madam Superintendent, first of all, I want to thank you for your years of service to the city of Brockton, but more importantly, Kathy, to the students. Uh, you're dedicated, you've really made an impact on thousands and thousands of kids, so thank you. Um, and I also want to thank you and Mike and facilities. I was recently at the Brookfield School, and I saw how happy the teachers are that there's air conditioners. And it is, it is, I mean, it's a little thing for a little money, but it's gonna make a huge difference. So kudos to you, it's really, and I'm sure there's other schools we can still look at. Um, thank you for this, Kathy, um, because some of us have served for a while, um, seen a few superintendents, and again, when you came in, this is what you decided to do, and it's, it's, it's eye-opening, I think, collectively. It's educational, it's informative. I'm dismayed and shocked that 9-11 isn't in the books mm -hmm. uh, for so social studies. I mean, that's, that's absurd. I don't know what it's gonna cost, but let's just get it done. I, does anybody, Aldo, you know, what's it gonna cost to buy books that's gonna have 9-11 in it? I mean. Well, the chief, chief financial officer is telling me, so we right now have an audit going on with John, Johns Hopkins University looking at all of our curriculum and making recommendations to the uh, chief uh, officer, uh, chief academic officer about looking at the middle schools and the high school is especially our focus. We're very pleased with what we've been able to do with a lot of moving the pieces around of making sure our kids have research-based reading program, phonics program, foundations, looking at for those kids that need additional tiered instruction to get where they need to be, <laughs> reading proficiently by grade three. So we're feeling good about what we're putting in our younger grades, but we need to pay attention to the middle and the high school. Yeah, I concur. And I also, I think Mike hit it on the head. I mean, we only see the school committee every two years, right, when we get sworn in. And several years ago, we tried to do these quarterly joint meetings, and that kind of went to, so we need to do these, these joint subcommittees of the council, the school committee, the mayor. I mean, that's why we serve, right? So let's work together as a team. But again, Kathy, thank you for everything you've done. I look forward to continuing working with you, Mike, and, and your team, because it's not just one person, it's everybody. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Sullivan. Council Cruz. Thank you. And just pretty simple. Well, first, I do want to say I see, because of our busy agenda tonight, we have most of the department heads out there. When you've been here 42 years, I'll make a motion to have you go first. So uh -huh. you, you've got that to look forward to. So Troy, you'll never get there. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just really want to thank, and you'll still be in here for the budget in a couple of weeks, but uh, I really want to thank you. Mike, I don't know if you really want to get into this, but uh, good luck when you move over there about four feet. And uh, I thank you so much. And I do want to mention one success every year that uh, you mentioned you'll be at the prom next week. I run a work event at Gillette Stadium every year. And every year the woman that runs it on a, on a, she didn't know the first year I was from Brockton, said, oh, we had a Brockton High prom here last night. They're the best behaved kids we have every single year. 
She said, I've never had to have the police come. She said, I do for several other towns. That Every single year she mentions, and now she knows I'm from Brockton, that they're the best behaved group of kids that come to Gillette every year to have their prom. And it's, it makes me proud, and, and I'm not surprised ever anyway. So, because one of the things we do in this city is we expect good behavior. We expect academic success. We expect our kids, we don't hope they do well. It's what the school department has done well, and I think we've done a great job supporting the school department, is we expect success. And when you do that, the kids react. And uh, so just thank you for everything you've done. We'll see you in two weeks with the budget. We'll kind of, it won't be so much fun then, but no, thank you and I make a motion to approve the resolution. Second. Second. The motion has been properly made and properly second. All those in favor? All those opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Mr. Thomas and the entire school department folks that are here. Uh, Madam Clerk, shall we go to agenda number one? Total appropriation of $660,000 from stabilization fund to non-net school spending. Invited Tori Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Aldo Petronio, Chief Budget Officer. Uh, Mr. Clarkson? Good evening, Mr. President, members of the council, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. So uh, I know the school CFO, Aldo Petroni, was here as well. Uh, Aldo and I communicate on a regular basis. It's my understanding that when this year's budget was being crafted, uh, there was uh, a known shortfall in the transportation costs and that it was discussed that at some point in the fiscal year, there may be a request before this body uh, to fully fund that, that's what uh, this request represents. Move favorable. Second. On the motion. On the motion. Council Cruz. Uh, and I'm sure I have this in our earlier. What do we spend total in the year on? So this 660 should get us through. Point six. Good evening. We spend a little over 12 million a year on transportation. That's regular ed, that's special ed, that's homeless. And that is something that is not reimbursed by the state, correct? Correct. Thank well, you. we do get a small amount on the homeless. So we spent a little over a million dollars on the homeless. A few years ago, they were reimbursing us 50%. Last year, about, and the next year, about 40%. And last year, about 31%. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, motion has been made and properly seconded. All those in favor? It will be recommended favorably to the full city council. Um, Madam Clerk, agenda number, item number two. Total appropriation of $20,000 from public property purchase of services to public property overtime. Invited James Cassiri, Superintendent of Buildings, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Cassiri, welcome. Good evening, counselors. Go for it. I uh, need a little more <laughs> overtime to make sure I'm covered for the end of the year. Move to recommend favorably. Second. Just on the motion. <coughs> do, do you want to speak on the motion, Madam? Councilor Isaac, no? Uh, Council Powell. Yes. Can, Mr. Kasseri, can you explain whether we're expending overtime now that we've taken over the Shaw Center and the Rock Stadium, It's now that it's our responsibility? That's where a lot of the overtime's going, yes. I, I'm sorry? Yes. We are? Yep. Okay. Now, and we're going to get into this with another resolve, but as I understand it, there's still an active lease where there are payments coming from the person who has leased the property. Do we know where those are going, and couldn't those be used to offset the, uh, the costs of whatever your men and women have to do? Well, I'm, I'm not privy to all the leases, but I will say that in order to reimburse an uh, a department for overtime, it will require a revolving fund. I don't have a revolving fund on overtime, so uh, it, it could get reimbursed to the city, but it, it wouldn't come to me. Yeah. Mr. Clarkson probably has some information on that. I actually reviewed uh, the lease between B21 and uh, EMC, the, the operator, today. So the lease calls for regular payments from July to November. Uh, so the last payment would have been made in November before the city took possession. So we do anticipate that next fiscal year, according to the lease anyway, there should be approximately $62,000 in payments that are made. Because there, uh, Jim is correct, right now there isn't a specific revolving fund set up, 
those payments will go to the general fund. So in effect, they'll defray the, co the additional costs, but there won't be any direct link to them. Okay, I, we'll get into more detail when, sure. we, when we do that other thing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, anyone Chairman. Anyone else? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. He asked the question I wanted to. Thank you. Motion. Uh, I made the motion. Who, who seconded? I did. All right, motion has been properly made and seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Madam Councilor. Since we have um, Superintendent of Buildings, uh, Mr. Casseri here already, can I'd like to make a motion to take um, 10 and 11 out of order. Second, second. Motion has been made and properly second. All those in favor? All those opposed? Number 10, Madam Clerk. Ordered that pursuant to the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, the City Council authorizes the reauthorization of the vacant and abandoned buildings revolving fund for the purpose of maintaining the abandoned building registry, as well as the closing, boarding up, and care of vacant and abandoned buildings. Expenditures from the vacant and abandoned buildings revolving fund shall be made on the authority and direction of the Brockton Building Commissioner, provided that not more than $250,000 may be so expended without further appropriation from the vacant and abandoned buildings revolving fund during fiscal year 20. Invited, James Cassiri, Superintendent of Buildings, Tori Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Cassiri, the microphone is yours. Well, it's, it's, it is what it is. We, we just have to keep the fund going, so we're here to ask that we... Uh, Favorable recommendation back second. to full council. Uh, motion has been properly made and properly second for favor recommendation. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, sir. I think you might as well stay right there because I think you got the next one. <laughs> Madam Clerk, number 11, please. Ordered that pursuant to the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, the City Council authorizes the reauthorization of the Demolition Revolving Fund for fiscal year 2020 for the sole purpose of helping to fund the cost in connection with the demolition of buildings in the City of Brockton. Expenditures from the Demolition Revolving Fund shall be made at the direction of the building superintendent with the written approval of the mayor, provided that not more than $110,000 may be so expended from the Demolition Revolving Fund during fiscal year 2020. Invited, James Cassiri, Superintendent of Buildings, Tori Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Move favorable. Second. 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 Motion has been properly made and properly second to recommend favorably. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, agenda item number four. Three. 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 Oh, three. Sorry, three. Total appropriation of 250000 from DPW snow removal to planning and economic development, $250,000, unfavorable. Invited Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Tori Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. May. Good evening, sir. Good evening and welcome. I'm glad to have this opportunity to come back and further explain um, our request uh, for additional funding or for transfer of funding to continue or, or to start, excuse me, a uh, feasibility and schematic design phase for uh, a new public safety facility or pu facilities. Um, you have um, been emailed select pages from the uh, facilities study that show the analysis uh, of the uh, two facilities and um, another section that shows recommendations for the two facilities. It also uh, goes into some detail looking at at least three different uh, potential sites um, for where the facilities could be located. Uh, our, our goal with the um, funding would be to bring on an owner's project management manager or owner's project representative who will then um, put together the necessary team to uh, analyze those three sites and to analyze uh, any additional sites to finalize uh, scopes of work with the, uh, uh, the fire, the police, with BEMA and with the IT department and then to um, develop what they call schematic design which if we were building a road would be considered like 25% design 
at each step along the process, we do need to come back to city council. Um, we anticipate putting together a team of uh, experts to represent the city that would include uh, both department heads and representatives from council. Um, and um, I don't know. Oh, at the last meeting, um, somebody said that we don't really know what this is going to cost. We don't own the land. And some of the sites we don't own the land. Some, uh, two of the sites we, um, uh, either through the um, uh, housing authority or through the um, city currently own um, two of the sites or, or a large portion of, of the sites. So all of those considerations are going to be taken into um, uh, into the equation that as we uh, start to develop these plans. And then um, one of the questions what came up was about cost. And quite frankly, we don't know what the cost is going to be. However, we do know what the programmatic needs of those two um, police and fire departments would be. We then did a back of the envelope calculation to come up with a, um, of, of a figure, um, including soft costs, oh, I'm missing a, um, hard costs of about uh, 62, 000, or 62 million, let's say 64 million, and then soft costs of about 12 or 13 million, soft costs being all the desks, furniture, lockers, um, finishes, all those uh, types of activities. The total cost for design is going to be somewhere in the eight million, eight and a half million, um, 8.6 range. Um, that is taking us from soup to nuts. That is taking us from the initial cons uh, conceptual studies through the um, uh, schematic design, through the architectural drawings, construction uh, management, testing, testing of materials, and commissioning of those facilities, which is the very end product. Um, so uh, <coughs> with that, I, I guess I'm avail available for your questions. Uh, Councillor Cruz. I'm interested, you said there are three sites identified. What, what sites are identified and in, in looking at? Um, as, as we looked at the programmatic needs of the departments, um, we identified um, general spaces. One of those is um, near the CSX facility on Freight Avenue. Um, now, when you say near, so not technically a piece of that not property? Not technically a piece of the, of the CSX area. It, it's, there's Brockton Iron and Steel, and there's uh, a couple of other pieces of property that, that front Court Street and go back Privately towards owned, privately owned, but not, privately owned parcels. Not part of moment. CSX, okay. Correct. Um, although CSX property could come into play, it all depends on how this is uh, laid out and designed. Another site that we looked at is on North Main Street. It's next to what used to be the Zare site or the microwire. Um, there's a large piece of property that is owned by the housing authority that is vacant. Um, in front of that, there is a small service station that I believe is uh, renting cars. So part of that is publicly owned, part of that is privately owned. However, uh, I, that is something, and I don't mean to keep interrupting, but I don't want to get past the housing authority is not a city agency. That is essentially privately owned. Yeah. We, we can't, I mean, we could take eminent domain uh, again, but we would have to pay market rate to the housing authority for that. Mm -hmm. We would have to buy that property. Um, right, I just, I mean. Whether that's a, a cash transaction, that's something that is going to come up through the whole study process of which site works best for the facilities, what's it's going to cost us. Right. The other site that uh, was recommended is uh, where the old high school is. Um, there's a rather large piece of property. Well, actually, if you ask the superintendent, she'd say the old high school is on Forest Street, so for, right. Forest Ave. But the, the new old high school. This <laughs> exactly. is the old, old high school, um, which um, fronting Warren and uh, West Elm, uh, that could be a potential site. So that and is- And that we do own. That is owned by this, a large portion, a majority of it is owned by the city, yes. But there are some private parcels that we would want to look at. And then if we were to do this feasibility study, they would then not 
confining themselves to those three pieces. No, of no. There, there may be other uh, facilities, that are others, other areas that, that may pop up um, through this design, uh, or through the study that we've done so far. Um, those were the, the lead contenders. Uh, there were some other properties on the south side that we were in discussion with about a, a elementary school um, that, you know, potentially could become available, but that, that takes those facilities too center. far out of the center of the city. And especially for fire station number one, uh, it needs to respond out, pl um, uh, out to Route uh, 24. It, it, fire station one report, uh, covers the entire highway out there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cruz. Uh, Council Powell. Yes, Mr. May, when you were here on May 6th, you said we've identified two sites. Um, when you made that statement, which were the two sites? Is it the Freight Street with Brockton Iron and Steel and the old, the, the Huntington Center, or is it North Main Street, or which two sites are you looking at for this feasibility study? It was actually three sites, and I misspoke in saying two because I had forgotten about the North Main Street site. Um, that is a little bit more of a difficult site to deal with um, because of the close proximity of, of residential uses and the, the tightness of the site. So it just was a, a slip of my mind, but there are three sites that, that we were looking at. Okay, now as part, initially, as part of the planning, uh, I take it you've met repeatedly with the police and fire chief to uh, to discuss with them the, the parameters of what their facilities would look like and where they should be located. The Arrow Street team um, through the city and, and the, the team that we put together has met extensively both with um, all the city department heads and the school department, and so. Um, we worked through all of the building needs for each and every department. So, uh, but yes, we did work very closely with the um, police and fire department. All right, now, based on the email that you sent out, the $250,000 is really about a, less than a third of what you're ultimately going to need. You're going Correct. to need, okay. Now, what was the justification for not telling us that? Well, I mean, if you're coming I in here I believe I did say that we would be pr asking for more money the next year. It, but not seven hundred ninety-three thousand dollars total. Well, it. I mean, if it, if I'm wrong, have someone. I'll stop and and uh, and defer to someone. But I, I n number one, we never heard which the two sites were. You just said we've identified well, two sites and things moved rather quickly. Um, and um, some of the uh, questions weren't asked, and um, you know it. It's unfortunate that, that we didn't have the chance to respond to all of them. I, I, I will be more on guard and try to uh, ask comprehensive questions then. Uh, I'd like to ask the indulgence of, of the council uh, and see if I can ask Chief Williams and Chief uh, uh, Crowley. Uh, Chief Crowley a if question. There are no objections? No objections. No. Chiefs? Chiefs? Chief and Chief, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but. Uh, Combined dispatch center, which is one of the mentions here, is that something that you both favor? And uh, any discussions with the union? That's a collective bargaining issue. Uh, Correct. I believe it would it would um, simplify and streamline our 911 dispatch. Right now, it all goes to the police station. It's transferred over to us. Yep. This, like I said, would speed it up, um, increase response times. I'm sorry, decrease response times as far as the call being taken, being dispatched, and. Um, if they, we had all the dispatchers in the same room, it would be much easier and better flow of information back and forth, whether it be a police call or a fire call. Okay, now, did, did the consultants meet with the command staff from the fire and police departments and get their input as to where they would like to be located, what type of facility, the size of the facility, what the, what the facility should house, what are the needs of the department looking ahead 10 years? Not, not at this point, Councilor. We haven't even got that deep into discussions. Okay. How, many, how many times did you have a chance, uh, both of you, to meet with the consultants? I believe mine was once. You met once? Right. And, and I once? met personally once and over the phone, probably twice. Okay. All right. That's all I have for that. Uh, 
Mr. May, is it your representation now tonight that we're, we're primarily looking at Brockton Iron and Steel property at 45 Freight Street for the location of this proposed public safety campus? I don't have a, a favorite site in this uh, process, and that's of, one of, that's of the one sites of the things. being looked at, of the sites being looked at, it's the Huntington Center on uh, Warren Ave and uh, West Elm, it's the North Main Street, and then it's the 45 Freight Street location? Yes. Okay. Those, I, are, those are the three that have been identified. Okay. Are you aware, because I have done some extensive research over the weekend on CSX and Freight Street, are you aware of any uh, environmental studies that have been done on the Freight Street property? Yes. If we've, uh, as we've prepared a uh, master plan for the CSX site, uh, we an area around that we do know about the um, uh, 21e work that both Brockton Iron and Steel and CSX have prepared. We do know of their um, AULs, um, which is activity and use limitation agreements. Yeah. Uh, we also um, would, in the study process, know what it would take to finalize any additional cleanup, and all of those go into the calculation of which site is is best suited for the needs of the Brockton Fire and Police Departments. Right. Do we have an approximate price on ac acquiring 45 straight <coughs> Freight Street? Uh, no, we do not. We don't. That would be Are determined through the Are we in any discussions study. with the owner? Of no, the we're not. We're not. It's too early to discuss that, I think. Well, so, we're looking at 250,000, possible maximum 793,000 for properties that either we don't own or, quite frankly, and I've checked with the school department, uh, they're not at least at this point ready to turn over control to the city for the Huntington Center or the old VHS high school site. So, I, um, I, that was that was not the impression that was given to us by um, uh, super, uh, Assistant Superintendent Williams. By, by whom? By, uh, excuse me, Mike Thomas. Okay, I, I talked with the superintendent, not Superintendent Thomas. Uh, so you're, it's your representation that he is looking to possibly have the school committee yes. cede control to the city? That was a discussion that we did have with him. He said it would be easy to move that. Okay. Of the work done, and, and it was extensive on the CSX property, um, and there was mention made in some of these reports that, well, the, the allegation was made that some of the Brockton Iron and Steel work encroached upon the CSX property, and yes, in sir. fact, they caused some of the contaminants to, reach, to reach over to the CSX property. Um, what bothers me is that if you look at the final report, which was submitted on June 30th, 2016. It talks about mitigating the contamination to acceptable levels. Yes. And I don't know about anyone else here, but if I had a son or daughter, and if I had a daughter or sister or wife that was going to work at a public safety facility and we had cleaned it to acceptable limits and they were either planning a family or perhaps they're pregnant. I'm not sure I'd put them on property like that. I well, mean, would you? That's one of the site's uh, characteristics that, that may or may not make that site um, a, a winner out of these three sites or, or the other sites that we come up with. Now, another thing about the acceptable standards with your use of air quotes is that DEP and US EPA have set standards for how much uh, background material or how much material can yeah. can stay on site. The current level that they have established right now um, through and, and um, identified through the activities and use limitations agreement is that regular commercial office facilities would be fine for that area. That's correct. They would not allow um, for housing development on those sites at the current acceptable level. Uh, that's the assumption that there's an assumption there that housing would inquire uh, or allow for children. Children play in the dirt. 
um, put their fingers in their mouths. Um, and, and that's why that level is set at that space. Now, if we were going to build a facility there, we would want to probably take it a little bit further in the remediation phase, and that's something that would be studied and developed through the feasibility and schematic design process. So there might be further environmental cleanup costs to the city? There might. It, 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 and if you know, this site were chosen, yes. May, may, maybe it's me, and I, I know there are five people that are in favor of passing the money on, but it, it sounds to me like we're taking a quarter of a million dollars subject to further appropriation of up to $793,000, and we're rolling the dice that one of the, these sites will be acceptable and we can do what we want to do, as opposed to perhaps looking at a catalog of all city-owned property and deciding where we might be able to locate a facility and not have the issue of either ownership or past environmental issues or all of the baggage that seems to come with what's being proposed now. And, and I just don't get it. I, I, I well, you know, it just, it would just seem to me one meeting with the fire chief, one meeting with the police chief and, and a phone call and the consultants have decided this is where you should go, this is the size of your, your building and this is how you should proceed. And I, I, I just find that, uh, Kevin and you know, I just find that rather odd. Met with the consultant. Okay. I, I couldn't hear that, I'm sorry. Galligan did have some communication with this agency. Okay. Written or verbal? Uh, face to face. Face to face? It, do we have Because do at the time he was in charge of my dispatch center. So oh, 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 with respect to the dispatch center, I'm talking about the facility as a whole and right. where it would be located. Is there any memorandum, any emails, any documentation that we have that shows the level of information that we sent to the consultants so that they suddenly decided this is where we're going to put the combined police fire and, and uh, uh, those inventories office. should be in the appendix okay all the um, uh, surveys that were sent out to all the department heads and their representatives are in the appendices now I guess from a planning perspective, because you're a professional planner in other communities in here, if we were going to build an 85.3 million or more public safety complex, why wouldn't we put it in an area that has prominence? Why wouldn't we put it in an area where, you know, we have major highways coming into the city, we have Belmont Street, we have Oak Street, uh, we have West Chestnut Street. It, it would make a statement that Brockton has turned the corner. It would make a statement that Brockton has seriously considered their public safety needs and this is the facility that they've decided to erect. Putting it down at Freight Street, I mean, how many people are going to see it? It's, it just um, doesn't give you the vista. Prisoners. It doesn't give you the vista that I've heard planners public talk about. Public safety buildings are not the same as, as City Hall or, or high schools where you, you, know, you, you create a sense of awe. The people who come and go from police stations usually aren't in the best of moods, and so having them out of the way is not a, necessarily a bad thing. For the most part, people coming in and out of the police station, other than the, the police officers, is it, it, it's an office building that, that can be put aside. It, it doesn't need to have uh, a, a, an area of prominence. Uh, in the city. The fire department, on the other hand, needs to have great and immediate access. And that's why we looked at, uh, when we looked at Court Street, we kind of ruled that out for a fire station because you have to get under the railroad tracks. And the fire department was very insistent that they not have to do that. So we then looked at the North Main Street, which would give you better access because you don't have to go onto the railroad tracks, but you still have, you, you're moving it a couple hundred yards further away from Route 24. And that's when um, Kevin Galligan recommended that we take a look at the Warren Avenue site. And with Warren Avenue, you can come, come straight down Legion Parkway, get to Main Street, uh, gives you two-way access, north and south access, either at Warren or at, at Main Street, and allows for those trucks 
and emergency vehicles um, to access the, access the west side faster? Well, I, I would say if I were going to spend $85.3 million for a building that it really doesn't matter what it looks like or where it's located, I, I think that's too bad. That may be the way, that may be the current thinking, but maybe it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe a public safety facility can be a statement of the city's prominence and the city's commitment to its citizens and the ability to design a building that's attractive and it changes the perception of Brockton. And uh, uh, Well, I mean, you, that's you, why there's, there's three sites that we're, we're looking at. One of them is Freight Street. Um, certainly Warren Avenue and West Elm has, uh, is a very prominent corner as uh, North Main Street has a lot of visibility also. But there could be other sites. Um, it's a very limited pool given the size of, of property that we need. And as you saw from the report, we did analyze each and every piece of property that the sur sur city currently owns and that is buildable. If we had a piece of property that large that was buildable, we would have sold it a long time ago. Well. I, I, uh, I think you know my feeling, and I well, yes, I do, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ian Neary, followed by Darren Court, and then Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. you as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. May. Yes, sir. Uh, and I don't want to think I sound like I'm a little off the wall, but uh, and if I do, tell me, um, because it seems that as we sit and we discuss you know, what you gave us in regards to other figures. To me right now, I just look at that as something that I put off to the side and say, okay, I don't want to say it's fake, it's real, but let's keep that off to the side and deal with what's in front of us, which is the $250,000. Now, in my mind, um, and, and I voted to pass on the $250,000 as much as, you know, some people have uh, asked my my questions concerned to why I would and and the one thing that I I have mentioned to people that have asked me in the last several um, several days is the fact that I firmly believe the Brockton Massachusetts needs a public safety building we're in Plymouth County mm -hmm. 26 towns <coughs> one city makes the 27 okay. and our towns have nicer public safety buildings than what we have as our police and our fire department. And to me, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. I know there's a few other councils that feel the same way. Um, and I've been here all my life, all my life. Um, be 65 years in August, I've been here in this great city of Brockton. And I think it's time that we do something in the best interest for those guys and gals that work in public safety. It's all one helmet the way I see it the seal, industry, education, public safety, it's all, it yeah. comes together as all one. So the way I look at it is, I mean, we can talk about sites, but I, I think the one thing I would like to see is just give me a design. You know, give me a design to what the fit would be here to have that type of a building in the city of Brockton and then move forward to what site do we move to? It, you see what I'm saying? Now, I, I mean, the yes. way I look at it, but let me just oh, let me finish court, my I'm thought sorry. because I'm a little bit older than you. But if you're building a home, and if I ever had the opportunity to build a, a new home, which I'm never going to, but if I did, I would sit down, sketch it out, design it out, and figure it out, you know, this is what I want, and then probably say, okay, now where do I go to see if there is a piece of land, which hopefully would be in the city or, or somewhere else or within another community within. But still, I'd be looking for the land afterwards instead of we're worrying about, you know, the sites. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way I'm, I'm looking at it because I think we still need to get started somewhere. I really, yes. I really do. And, and I think in retrospect to, to both chiefs being here this evening, um, they're here and they're showing their support because of, of, of naturally their public safety. And they're trying to show the support of what, what is needed for each of their departments. And I'll tell you, the Enterprise did a nice job the other day Local page, six pictures, and what did they show you? The police station. Junk. Wires hanging out of a wall. Ceiling tiles missing. Leaks. We got to step over puddles. We handcuff the inmates, if you want to call it, or the restees to, to pipes. Okay, I know they were arrested, but is that how we treat them? Just 
handcuff them over there. And if we don't have enough room, I think they still send them down to the Plymouth County Correctional Facility as a holding cell. Mm -hmm. Down there, it's a little different. They're put into a room, and then correction officers, probably two to three, probably stay in that room with them. But just seeing that, and I don't know, it just, to me, I just think we need we need to start somewhere, and, and, and that's what I'm trying to look at. So I'm, I'm not through, but I'm gonna let you, and then I'll finish up when, when you're done sure. to respond. Um, the the um, surveys that the uh, uh, Arrow Street did with the department heads, and the interviews that they did on follow-up um, helped create um, what they call a, a, a program, which is the, the square footage that each department would need. So that is taken into consideration. Then, because we were looking at three particular sites, they do what the, is called a FIT study. And um, those are in the, the documents that we emailed out to you. Um, so uh, they look at you know, how it would fit on Freight Street, how it would fit on you know, uh, on North Main Street and whether you have two facilities on one lot, one facility on one lot, and then we all, we, so we look at all three of the sites to see how it fits out. So you get an idea of what space you need to fit on those sites, but we didn't go that next phase to take it into a, another design. We, we uh, wanted to limit that until we got to the next phase because this, um, this study was just paid for to do a, uh, a, an analysis and, and a series of recommendations, which is what we have. And, 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 I, underst and I understand that. And, and if anything, I mean, when we, we got to that phase, naturally I'd, I'd wanna see something put in, in, in front of me. So, mm -hmm. um, but just going back to, to what we have here to work with at this point in time, and again, just leaving this off to the side. I, I mean, what would be, what would happen if if this council decided that, well, we're not gonna give you the $250,000, we're gonna give you the $50,000 to get going with. What's, what's your reaction to that? Um, $50,000 doesn't advance the ball very far. Um, we had heard of other communities getting, you know, $50,000 grants from the state. That basically gets you a, um, a rendering of a building. And, and you might look at what happened at um, uh, what, what is now Vicente's. That originally somebody had come in and done a drawing of a police station. That's kind of what you, you get for $50,000. It's, it, it's a picture. But to right. take it that next step to actually know what the building is going to look like and know what it's going to cost and whether or not you want to go the next step is, is much more detailed in that process. Right. Right, I, I understand that. Then, if we even if we went up a little bit, a little bit further, what I'm trying to do is just to come into play here, so that we can do something, and, and so that we can get we can get going. That's I'm, I'm and, always and each just year. Used. Remember, it gets the the longer we wait, the more expensive but it gets. It, it, and I'm not saying that we have to, you know. No doubt. I'm just looking this at this is a, a guaranteed price. If you want to bring this to back to into that. place, then then this naturally naturally it makes it difficult for any of us to to digest all in one you know, all in one type of sitting or two sittings or, or even if it's a, a year or two. I mean, it's still, it, it's, it's still a lot of money. I'm just, I just want to see something going. Yes, sir. Then to just keep talking about it, send it back, forth, back, forth. And um, I mean, the money's there and, and uh, um, I, mean, I mean, that's the way I, I look at it. And, and if, even if we had to give you 100,000, I mean, if we gave you 100,000, then that's what you're gonna have to work with to be 100,000. That's 000. what I have to work with. That's what you'd have to work with, but at least we're getting somewhere, we're getting started. And I think that's what's most, in, most important. So, um, and, and I'll tell you right now, I mean, just as, just as finishing up on, on what I'm talking about, and, and I know other councils may have a say, but I mean, at the, at, at the end, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna put out a motion that we, we move it up to about $100,000 and let's get going. We're gonna if we're gonna keep talking about it, we're not gonna go nowhere, <laughs> and that's what I'm afraid of. As we do a lot of things, you know, it's time. It's time, and I know others have feelings, and, and you know they they want to do different things things for the schools. We're gonna do things for the schools. We're still doing good things for the schools, and, and the schools are doing a lot on their on 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 with their own, and they're getting money to do things. So it's not the school buildings are in a, you know that bad of condition, and we're already working on now trying to trying to get a grant passed and working with the deputy superintendent so that we can do something with the with the Huntington uh, uh, roof of the Huntington School on Warren Avenue because why we need that building. That building's not going anywhere, and we're going to get we're going to get that roof taken care of because we need it. That building's a gem, and it's not going anywhere. As long as I'm around, it's not going anywhere. So, but in any case, uh, 
there'll be a, there'll be a motion coming after some of the others get uh, get finished talking. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilor Langford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. May. Yes, sir. Um, do you have any idea in terms of how long it's going to take to do that study in terms of conclusion? How long it will take? Yeah. Um, I think the design phase, um, if we were to start, uh, you know, in July, um, it, it would be through next spring. So you believe that? It, it's six to nine months okay, to, six. to finish up the conceptual and, and bring the team together. Because one thing that I do know is that we are very good at doing studies, and we are very good, I mean, based on your job, at doing them in a way that take probably so long. But here's what I can tell you. Um, I believe in 2017, when I was doing my own thing out there, I spoke about the necessity of having a police headquarters. And one of the locations that I was actually thinking about was where Vicente is located now. It would have been a good. But with regard to you know our wonderful chiefs, I believe that there was some injustice. What I mean by this is that for something like this, I believe we should have had more open conversation in regard to how they can actually participate. And I mean, obviously, both chiefs said that one of them had one meeting and the other one had like one meeting and a phone conversation. Let's face it, we are asking to spend $250,000 of our taxpayers. And I'm the kind of person that truly believe in paying attention to every single penny. Because when it's come down to our taxpayers' money, we have to be very careful of that. But as we speak, you said that you believe it's going to take at least six to nine months. And it will become very public at that point. No, I mean, to be honest with you, at this point, I'm not really worried about whether or not this study will be public. But <laughs> I'm the kind of person that live my life or focus on reason. Mm -hmm. But you are not able to tell me exactly this study, if we do go along with it, it's going to take six months or nine months. You said probably. And the possibility of knowing six and nine months can be two years. I've seen some of this thing going on in Brockton. So it is unfortunate we have to actually sound like that, but let's face it. The former council president obviously said we have 26 towns and one city in the Plymouth County. I think it is a shame we do not have one of the best police and fire headquarters in the Plymouth County. Although some of our towns and city, I mean some of our towns do have wonderful fire station and police station. But what hurt me the most is the fact that I can see there is a lack of transparency in regard to the numbers. And I am actually talking to you because this is your job as the city planner. Because if you take the time to actually come in front of us to make that request, I would assume that you know all the information. I'm not saying you don't, but I would assume that you are ready and able to actually give all the details that are necessary. Number two, you provided a 500 pages document, which you know, I mean, some of us do have the time to read it, believe it or not, but I haven't done with it yet, and I will read every single page of it. I do have the time to do this, but when that moment comes. So you are asking us to spend $250,000 of our taxpayers. Council, um, the former city council president is more than happy to give you 100000 and I can tell you that I don't know what I'm going to do yet because based on your explanation and according to what you said, you haven't convince me yet, obviously. But what's so unfortunate is to actually see both chiefs. I mean, I'm assuming they both are willing to talk to because obviously they are the boss in terms of like that will be take over those departments. But they don't have any knowledge whatsoever, the depth of this. And you are talking about spending millions of dollars. And the last meeting I stated that we do not own those facilities and you said it were three, you misspoken. For something so important like that, I would assume you will know exactly what you're talking about. Again, I'm not saying you don't know what you're talking about, but to miss, to I mean, to forget one of those locations, I think it was very unacceptable. Well, we have discounted one of them because of the size of the site, but it is in the study. Okay, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, and none of my colleagues do not mind, can I ask the chief both a question? Chief would that be okay? No objection? Which chief? Both of them? Both of them. Chiefs? Musical chair. Thank you. Chief Williams. Yes, uh, the same question goes with both. According to the three locations, which we are about to study, if this do go alone, do you guys satisfy with all three of them, or do you believe that 
I mean, putting those two facilities in there will be okay for your departments in terms of like the amount of parking space that you're gonna need to actually park some of your cruises and stuff like that. Do you believe this location will be able to satisfy the needs of your department? No, Councillor, because the Freight Street property really, as Mr. May mentioned, it doesn't put that fire station where I need it. Okay. <clears throat> I think I'd be a little bit better off at the Warren Avenue West Elm location or on the North Main Street location. Um, a large percentage of my runs out of Station 1 on Pleasant Street go west. Mm -hmm. So to put that uh, maybe a third of a mile to, to the east and off of Court Street, it, it's really going to hamper my response times. Let's say uh, my Station 1 even responds all the way to the eastern line on Pleasant Street, mm -hmm. um, Sumner Street West, um, those neighborhoods up in that area. You really, they're stretched at this point being on Pleasant Street to move it down to Freight Street would really hinder that um, I think one of the conversations I had with Mr. May is and Chief Crowley can explain this better a, a police department isn't as critical to have it in a central location let's say because obviously police cruisers are out on the road mm -hmm. it's it's more of an administration building um, than it is a housing from where they respond from, mm -hmm. like like the fire department is. So it's um, a conversation I had with Mr. May is if the Freight Street property was used for, let's say, a, poli a new police station, we may look at the North Main Street location for strictly for fire. In that case, we're not talking about one single public safety building. We're talking about two. Um, and maybe Mr. May can explain that a little better than I. Uh, what direction he took on that after that conversation. Okay, but thank you. Um, Mr. President, through you, through the members, if we can have Mr. May on the mic, um, I would greatly appreciate it. Still have the floor. Thank you. Mr. May, um, yes, well, sir. at your presence, and the chief is behind you, and according to what he said, it seems like one of the location that you are talking about, spending $250,000, he's not satisfied with it. So if the chief, well, we the person mentioned that um, as I was speaking with um, Councillor Farwell that there were three studies that we looked at uh, or three sites that we were looking at one works well um, uh, and, and that the the Freight Street Court Street site did not work for the fire department now that doesn't mean that it wouldn't work for the police department um, there's no reason why they have to be on the same site but it would be nice if they were in a campus so if we were splitting up the the pair which the study takes a look at the police station could be on freight street the fire station could be on north main the fire station could be on on warren avenue there's a couple of different places where the central fire station could be warren avenue and north main as the chief said are a much better location for them and i would venture to say that that um, in in my conversations with deputy chief galligan Warren Avenue is probably a better site for the fire station because it's just that much closer to um, the west side. Uh, yeah, the west side of the city. Well, uh, thank you. So, um, if I go back to the last meeting that that we had, uh, I believe I stated that, and I spoke with somebody in Washington D.C. in regard to the the problem of having two facilities like the fire station and the police station together. And from my understanding, according to your report. It seems like you want to put both together. This was. Am we're I, am we're I not talking about a single facility. We had been talking about a campus, so it would be two separate buildings. <laughs> in two separate location or in one location. It, there could be two buildings on one location. There could be two buildings on two locations. So even as we speak, um, there is no certainty in regard to whether or not. No, you know, that's, in, in the, that's the point. Uh, of let me just let me just finish my statement. The study. And the statement that I made, I mean, although I'm not a cop, obviously, but I did study criminal justice in college. And what I said last meeting is, I'm sorry, Chief, for actually having you waiting for me, but I'll ask Chief Crowley a question. The statement that I made last meeting was that, according to what I was told, it's not safe to have two facilities like a fire station and a police station at the same location. And I made that statement openly. But based on what you just said right now, it seems like it's two different things, meaning 
according to the study you would like to do, it's a possibility of having a combination of you know, the fire station and the police station. And my biggest concern was the fact that given what we are dealing with in nowadays around the world, I do not believe we should have both of them at the same location, which was the statement that I made last meetings. And based on what you just stated now, you claim that it's not definite that we're going to have both at the same location. It's a possibility. I am lost. I am lost. I'm completely lost. Although, I have to admit, I haven't read that 500 pages document, which I will read, but I am not satisfied at all in regard to voting in this proposal you are asking, because the chief is behind you. He said that, well, we don't believe that, well, he doesn't believe one location is good. And my colleague, Council Farrell, spoke about, do you, do you, do you have any concern in regard to the environment, in regard to health? And you said that you don't believe that one of the location will be feasible in regard to the study. So if you don't believe, no, I, oh, I, well, hold on, let me just finish my point. Say that. If you don't believe, well, you said, you said it is a concern that you also have in regard to the study. I cannot recall every single word that you said, but I do, I did take some notes. So if you have that concern, why would you even intern turn that motions? If not, get rid of it. Don't even talk about that location at all in regard to the three locations. I would be more satisfied if you came this evening and said it that according to your own research, I believe one of the locations, which the chief, I believe, spoke to you, he doesn't believe that it will satisfy his department. You could have said, well, the chief doesn't believe that, the, that, 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 that location will be satisfy his department. It I would be more than happy. I would be more than happy to. We already to know that it wouldn't satisfy the fire department. Well, I didn't know that. We I, I just didn't said know. that. It could satisfy the police department. But we were talking about having a fire station and a Th police station this together. Is to, this is to look at the public uh, safety facilities. We, we would think that a campus would make sense, and that's one of the things that we were looking at is how could we put these both adjacent to each other. Um, one area didn't work well for the fire department, and that was the Court Street lot. There is the North Main Street lot, which could work, but is a very tight fit. And then there's the Warren Avenue site. Now, again, we're talking about two different buildings in an in a area. We're not talking about one public safety building. But as I was listening to you very carefully, very carefully, I did not hear anything about you thinking about having two different locations. I did not. I did not hear even one word of that. And maybe it's my age, probably too old to understand exactly where you're coming from. But according to your statement, I strongly believe, and I still believe, you wanted these buildings at the same location. And I made a statement last meeting, and some of my colleagues can attest to that, and I said, I didn't believe it was safe. Although I'm not the police chief, I'm not the chief of the fire department. But um, for the sake of this evening, I'm going to leave it. They could be like two that. locations, yes. Oh, I mean, I do believe it should be. Here's what I would like to make crystal clear. Do I believe we should have a new police department and a new fire department? Yes. But in order for us to do so, we have to do it accordingly, meaning follow the right process by using the taxpayers' money to do this study. And I also yeah, believe yeah. that the fire That's chief. What we're doing. And I also believe that the fire chief and the police chief should not only have one meetings, but also have the input into it. Because believe it or not, yes, you might be the city planner. Oh, I'm holding, I'm holding, Mr. May, I'm talking to you. I'm listening. You, you may be, you know, you may be the city planner, but I do not believe you truly know what it takes to run their departments in regard to um, the importance of having a location that will satisfy the needs. We are talking about spending thousands of dollars. So my concern is that it seems like we haven't even taken the time to do any in-depth analysis in regard to how to go about this. But at the same time, here you are coming in front of us, but at least in front of me, asking to spend the taxpayer money to do steady on location that we don't even own. So for me, I guess this is truly unacceptable. And like I said, although 
I haven't read that 500 pages document, which I will read it, I will read it. But I think we as legislators should have been able to have some what I call a synopsis about exactly the plan and how to go about it. Because how could you possibly expect us, although some of us don't believe we should read it, but I do believe we should read it. How could you possibly expect us to read a 500 pages document in less than a month and then now I address you that, are, sir. And now you are in in the first email that went out. Right. I shared all four volumes. I'm sorry, Chief. I'm going to so catch that you, guys going you would have them at one time because if I were to take select pages out and distribute just individual pages, I would be accused of not sharing the information with you. Now that the inf and and in that email when I sent all 500 pages, I specifically said you need to go to volume four and start at page 46. I never expected you to read all 500 pages. Now, the second email that was sent out specifically takes those two sections out of volume three and of volume four. They're about 20 to 25 pages apiece. So there's no reason to read all 500 at this sitting. So that was, that was fairly well explained in the email, I believe. But I mean, you know, I, I, I completely somewhat not understand, but have an idea of what you are coming from because I, I don't believe I understand it at all. But so here's, here's a piece of advice that I could have given you. Um, I understand that it was a 500 pages document, which you know exactly what you did. But I strongly believe you could have at least have one of your staff, which the city of Rockton is paying for, do a summarization, probably 20 pages, even 50 pages. That some of us. I'm assuming would have had the time to do it. And some of my colleagues stated that um, anybody that read 500 pages document is crazy. Um, I heard that statement. But what I can tell you is that um, it's going to take me some time, obviously, to read it. So for the sake of our chief and also being respect respectful, I would like to ask Chief Crowley um, the same question. Uh, chief, yes, do you believe this location that Mr. May is, or Mr. May would like to do the study, will be able to satisfy the need of your department. Let's say that we combined both departments together. Would you be happy with all of them? All, as three, we speak? all three work for the police department. It's okay. important that we be in the core of the city because that's where we're the busiest. So um, that's my professional opinion. It needs to be downtown. Um, and either site works. Thank you, thank you, Chief. And Mr. May, according to Chief, you know, to the chief of police, he said that all three of them are good for his department. And based on what the fire chief stated that, it seems like, I mean, some of your cruisers, if not most of them, are always on the road. You don't really need them to be in the station. But in the spirit of that, it's completely different for the fire station, which I believe they have to have all, the, all their um, fire trucks or whatever you call them in the location. So for the sake of Chief Crowley, he's okay with that department, all three of them. But Chief... Um, the fire chief doesn't satisfy. Thank you, Chief Crowley. Th thank you, um, thank you, thank you, Chief. So, here's my problem right now. I am okay with the statement that the police chief stated, and also the fire chief. But what I'm not okay with is the fact that you haven't been able to convince not only me, but I also believe some of my colleagues. So now the question is, what are you gonna do to convince me? Convincing me by giving me the proper information that I need in order for me to make the best decision in the interest of our taxpayers. And the next question is how long it's gonna take you to provide me with the information that I need to move on because I would like this to move on. I would be more than happy to vote by giving you a million dollars as we speak if I can. You have the May 9th email. Yes. And the two attachments. Okay. Those so two that, that attachments completely summarize the existing facilities <coughs> in both the police station and fire station number one. The second volume, volume four, um, describes uh, the recommendations for fire station number one and for the um, police station. Okay, so what- A very succinct summary of, of everything you need to know. So one last question. As we speak, um, you do not know whether or not the fire department and the police department will be at the same location. That's, that's, that's one of my questions. 
And also, do you believe the facilities you are about to study, if some of my colleagues voted in favor of this, will be able to fit both of them? Well, although one of them, the, ch um, the fire chief, says no to it. I, I hope you will get rid of that one, because he says no. But do you believe the other two will be able to house both our fire department and also the police department? Would you see us to this? The drawings that are in volume four show that both a fire and police station would work on Warren Avenue and fit on Warren Avenue. A fire station and police station would also fit on uh, the North Main Street lot if that were um, chosen. And although it is a tight fit on that site, and the drawings also show that a police station and fire station, even though a fire station has been removed from the um, opportunity on the Court Street, Freight Street site. Okay, so you're you talking have about- drawings that show those. Okay, you're talking about, uh, one last question, Mr. Chairman. Hold on, I okay. mean, uh, we're going around and around and around. He basically have stated that the he's not exactly sure how the things are gonna be done until the studies are complete. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't put the, the cart before the horse. You gotta put the horse in front of the cart. So we've already discussed this and he's basically telling you that he hasn't quite figured that stuff out, and that's why we're discussing the, the, the buy-in to see if we can actually even move forward. Which I think is good, but the question that I have is actually on historical preservation. Uh, you, you, I think you, you stated that um, the old, old Brockton High School, taking it over. Uh, do, you, do you believe in historical preservation? Uh, yes, I do believe in historical preservation. So let's say that we go with this lot would there be a possibility to somewhat save some of that building? It, it is a possibility. We did take a look at that um, in the original study. Um, as we progressed into the site design, uh, we felt that the building probably is not seismically sound for police facilities. Um, it would, uh, uh, FEMA and, um, uh, Department of Homeland Security have, have established um, guidelines for public safety buildings, mm -hmm. and uh, given that it is a unreinforced masonry building, um, <laughs> it, it, it probably would cost too much to retrofit. Mm -hmm. Also, the program would be um, uh, a little inefficient at the site, um, so the study team would have to determine whether uh, it would be feasible to seismically secure the building and whether it's financially feasible to um, reprogram the existing space without having to um, go forward with uh, designing a new building for that space. So this, would, this is going to be part of this study as well? Yes, it is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, I'm glad we got to the end of that. Uh, Council Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. May, good evening. Good evening, sir. I, I don't think there's anybody up here. I, I know there's nobody up here that is anti-public safety. Uh, the men and women of the Brockton Police and Brockton I Fire, agree with you. they're working in an outdated, archaic, confined, it shouldn't happen. Same thing with the schools. Um, but but I, a couple questions I had, and I, I don't think when you appeared before us the last time, I don't think it was probably your best moment in terms of information sharing. I don't think it was 100% clear. Correct. I think you said that to us. And, that's fine. Um, my question I had is for the ward counselors and the at lodges there was a consultant that did an analysis and recommendations. They did surveys and follow-ups with the chiefs, with department uh, heads. Um, were any elected officials asked for their input relative to potential locations? Uh, with potential locations? No, sir. Yeah, I think that, that probably would have made sense, at least for the ward counselors and, and us that serve citywide. Now, I, I, do, I do actually take a little... Uh, a dismay with, with your idea of public safety buildings, newer ones, not being in the, uh, a well-traveled th throughway. Situates on 3A, it's beautiful. Norwell's on 58. I mean, so I disagree with you on that, but that's I'm okay. At the end of the day, we need to get a survey to get the ball rolling. I think Dennis, the Dean of the Council, hit it on the head. You know, I, I don't think a quarter of a million dollars is appropriate right now. I wouldn't support that. But if we can, as a gesture, mm -hmm. make sure we move forward to get it going, you know, get the ball rolling so that the chiefs didn't waste their time talking to the consultant. And I would ask you, Mr. May, to have the consultant speak to the ward councils of those three locations and the at-larges. It's the only thing that makes sense. And that would go yes, through sir. the present. Um, so, Councillor from Ward 3, I, I, I am going to support your recommendation of making an amendment to cut 150 from the 250 
for a hundred thousand appropriation. Is that is that what you want to do? That that's correct. If you could that's make correct, that in a motion, I'll support it, Dennis. Well, I'm going to make that a motion at this particular point in time that we change the uh, we amend the amount from the two hundred fifty thousand dollars to a hundred thousand, so that we can at least get started and, and get something in front of us. I'm going to second that amendment as stated by the dean. Uh, on the motion. Council on the motion. Um, and Council Beauregard and then Lally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just would like to clear up a few things because sometimes people at home don't always get the whole picture. So to Mr. May's credit, we, he did send us the email on May 1st. It was at noontime. And our meeting where we were able to ask questions was May 6th. That gave us a good week to look it over. Now, I'm not saying everybody went through it with a fine tooth comb, but it does give us some time to get an idea. So I, I thank you for sending us that. Um, I felt this is long awaited. I toured the police station six years ago and advocated to get a new police station back then. This is a long overdue. I would have support, I supported the 250, um, 250,000, and I'd support it right now if that was still on the table because we need to do the study. It's exactly what we're a you're asking for is a study. And without a study, we can't get expert advice. We're asking, we're not planners, we're not public safety, we're not architects. I mean, we really, this is what we're paying for, and if we want a state-of-the-art faci facility, we're going to pay for it. So um, I just, I had to say that. I'm all about our schools, but we can't put all our eggs in one basket. If we don't take care of our public safety, how are we going to take care of our um, children? We can have all the brand new schools, but if we don't have uh, police officers and fire uh, firefighters that are going to buildings that they could work in. I, and I'll tell you, I'll tell everybody at home, I wouldn't work in that police station right now. I wouldn't work, didn't want, when I toured it six years ago, I was appalled. I was like, what kind of morale do our police officers have going into this building? And uh, no matter, even if they spend just one minute in there, it is not, it's not what I would want for our police officers. So I, I'm going to support this. I want to see it go move forward. And I also agree with um, Mr. May. It does need to be in the core of our city because putting something as public safety in a neighborhood that it, it'll help clean up certain neighborhoods and that's how I look at it. I do want to see it in that area. Um, and one idea that I had actually put out a few years ago is maybe possibly having um, an annex uh, down like different smaller stations. One idea was down on the north side in my uh, in Ward 7, the old Walgreens right on North Montello. I think that would be ideal to have, but um, of course that's down the line. But um, I, I support this and I, I hope it moves pretty quickly because it's long awaited. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. I, I truly believe that you all support public safety, so I, I don't want to ever give that impression that, that you don't. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Borgard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. May. And uh, if I could ask the fire chief for one moment, just one quick question, I'm sorry. Uh, let's clear this up from the beginning, though, and understand that, again, none of us are opposed to what is long overdue. Mr. Borgard, your yes. question was on the motion, right? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so, uh, no, I wanted to ask, you brought up something about the dispatch, and if they're together, it's better, but can so. that be in a separate building? In other words, could there be just a dispatch building? I'm just, yes. I'm merely throwing that out. Okay. Yes. So you said that if they're coordinated, then that means it's a faster response time for both? Well, I just, I just think communication would, would run smoother. Okay. Right now, the, the, the f police dispatchers and fire dispatchers are in totally, two totally different locations, sure. obviously. Yes. Police dispatchers, the 911 call takers, are at the police station. When a medical call comes in via 911, let's say, it's, di it's transferred from the police station to the fire alarm office. Sometimes information isn't okay. back and forth as well as it could be, if they're all in one, one big room, let's say. If you have the, the 911 call takers in one area, they can actually better communicate with my fire alarm operators if they're on the other side of the room, um, giving them a better idea of what the, the, the information given by the caller is. Um, right now it's done by telephone you know, back and forth, oh, wow. like talking okay. to someone on the phone. And sometimes the information just doesn't get passed as, as smoothly as we would like. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you, Council. On the motion, Council Lally. All right. 
I will. Uh, I will keep this up. I'll keep this quick. I. Uh, I don't think anyone really anticipated Nine o'clock already, and we have about another it. six yeah. items to go. All right. Um, and Larry hasn't had know, a chance to speak yet either. Yeah. <laughs> first, first <laughs> things. First things first. I often use you know my age kind of as a joke, as a benchmark to how uh, how long things have been around, but the the you know station one and the police station have been around a very long time and if we keep going the way we're going right now they're going to be here a lot longer a lot longer um there's two questions will this money you know if we if we were to approve it right now further further things we will get more information from this um, we envision this as a as a multi-stage process um we've i've drafted a scope of work for a owner's project manager to, to help us do this. There are probably four phases before we even get to the construction phase. Each one of those phases, we're going to be coming back to you with reports, with progress, and what our next steps are going to be. Right, so it'll, it'll help us get a better idea yes. of what we're gonna be working with. And, yeah. and I also anticipate that a member of council will be, or two, will be represented on the uh, committee. Yeah. But that is up to the President. And you, you know, you in your capacity as a professional planner view this as a necessary step. It is a necessary step to advance the process, yes. Um, you know, I think this is, I think this is needed. I think this is overdue. Uh, I would vote for the full $250,000, but as the, uh, my colleague from Ward 3 has brought up, uh, if, if the only way we're going to get anywhere tonight is by, you know, just, just moving 100000 just getting the process going, uh, I think we need to do that. It's the Thank first you. step. Thank yep. you, sir. Mr. President. I call the vote on the Roberts rules. Second. A motion has been uh, a motion for a vote has been called on the Robert rules. Therefore, all discussions will cease. A motion was made to reduce the appropriation from two hundred fifty thousand dollars to one hundred thousand dollars. Roll call vote, Mr. President. A roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Councillor Azak. Yes. Councillor Beauregard. Yes. Councilor Cruz. No. Councilor Darincourt. Yes. Councilor Arneri. Yes. Councilor Farwell. Yes. Councilor Lally. Yes. Councilor Rodriguez. Yes. Councilor Sullivan. Yes. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, one no. Mr. President, I'll make a favorable recommendation as amended back to full council. Second. Motion has been properly made on the motion. Yeah, on the motion for for the one hundred thousand, I would just say to my colleagues, I hope that Mr. May will first determine if a piece of property is for sale, and if so, at what approximate price. I don't see any reason why we should do a feasibility study on something that someone doesn't want to sell, or the price may be so ex exorbitant that we can't afford it. Uh, I know there's been some talk about taking property by eminent domain, but if we're going to take the 100,000, let's put it where it will do the most good. Let's study the piece of property where we think we have the most reasonable likelihood of having success. Thank you. On the motion. On the motion. Just to Councilor Farwell, uh, case law, federal and state, it's very, very difficult to take a railroad property via eminent domain throughout the Commonwealth and throughout the nation. So you bring up a good point. On the motion, Councilor Cruz? On the motion, just a brief, the, the idea of not looking at eminent domain, and again, I believe the CSX property itself is very difficult uh, unless they're looking to sell. The idea of not looking at a piece of property until we know how much somebody wants to sell it for, that's not how eminent, and by the way, the enterprise should know it's not eminent domain, it's eminent domain. Um, that's not how it works. It's how government operates across this country. It's one of it's in the Constitution as something that the uh, that the government has the right to do and the need to do in many many cases. And this city has done before. So thank you. All right. Uh, um, a motion has been favorable made. as amended. As Back amended. to the council. And second, all those in favor of submitting it to the council as amended. All those opposed. The motion carries. Madam Clerk, now we can go to number four ordered that the Brockton City Council, acting on behalf of the City of Brockton, does hereby grant a perpetual right and easement to Massachusetts Electric Company, said land being located as lot 46 on City of Brockton Assessor's Map number 32, 331 Oak Street off Colonatha Ave. Invited Timothy Carpenter, Superintendent of Parks. 
Mr. Chairman. Councillor Yuneric. If, if I might, Mr. Chairman, I know that um, there are some people here as well from uh, National Grid, and I, uh, if we could, if, if, uh, if councillors do not mind that we just take a little leeway and maybe we can also hear from them at the same time in regards to uh, the serious situation that happened over the um, the weekend with the manhole cover. So um, I'd just like to make sure that they get included in, in being able to speak here this evening as well, Mr. Chairman. Or without, our, without our objections? Well, Anybody? Mr. Well, President, it's, uh, not, it's not specific germane to the written agenda item. I think you as president would have the ability after we hear this agenda item, if you as the president choose to hear that. Well, well then we'll do that because I think it's important for the citizens. Yes, I concur, but it's not germane to that. Thank All you. Right. All right, thank you. Uh, why don't we take care of the, uh, the agenda item that Mr. Carpenter is here to discuss with us and then we'll go into um, a point of information over what happened this week. Mr. Carpenter. Good evening, councillors. Uh, so this easement, um, currently the power for my maintenance facility at the golf course comes in off of uh, Mellon Street uh, at the end of the road there. Uh, it's uh, aerial lines to about, I would say, 10 to 15 yards to the right side of my 11th green, at which point it goes underground. Uh, to my knowledge, it is direct burial. There is a primary and an auxiliary. Uh, at this point, um, we've switched back and forth at least three times since, uh, since I've been with the city. Uh, I know that our primary is basically useless at this point. We're running on the auxiliary line. Uh, so this easement would allow National Grid to come in off of Colantha, which is a street just to the right of the parking lot for the golf course. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Thank you. Oh, yes. Motion has been offered <laughs> made in second. All those in favor? All those opposed? <laughs> Motion carries. Now, if we could have the gentleman from uh, National Grid come to the microphone, please, uh, please give your name to the clerk. Good evening, Mr. President and Council Members. Joe Cardinal, Manager of Customer and Community Relations for National Grid in the Brockton office here. And Peter, National Grid. Okay. Uh, as you know, that we had some issues with some um, ex uh, another explosion in the downtown area. Uh, another manhole cover just blew last week, and this is the third one we've had in the city in the last. Uh, I've been in this council for what six years, and this is the third one we've had. So, uh, please enlighten us as, as to exactly what's going on and why these things keep happening in the city. Sure, as um, as I had spoke to the council a couple of years ago um, in regards to the old um, network system that we have here in, in downtown Brockton. Um, after the first manhole dislodged back um, in July, I think, I believe it was July 1st of 2016, um, we started actively looking at changing out the network system that we have here in downtown Brockton to a, a radial loop fed uh, underground system and before we got to designing and planning and implementing that we took it upon ourselves to change out large sections of the older secondary cable that existed in the downtown to get the old cable out and put a new cable in um, we inspected every single manhole in the downtown area 140 um, manholes and we installed 25 vented manholes. And at that time, we were pretty confident that we were gonna be okay with what we had as we prepared for the new system. Unfortunately, this past weekend, we had another failure of the cable which caused the two manholes to dislodge. And it's part of the old secondary cable that failed. Okay. Uh, Council, is uh, Council Cruz? Yeah, I, uh, uh, Mr. Cadden, I, I <coughs> interested dislodge, it's quite a term. Dislodge sounds to me like they came up an inch or so. These were explosions. And I'm reading that we need to change more items. How many more manholes should be vented? How many more are there that should be vented? Well, there's 140 of them right uh, now, and I believe, Mark, the plan is to vent as many as we possibly can. Well, it should be 140 then. Yep. And well, they, uh, with the, all due respect, Council, there are some that would, would be on a sidewalk and you wouldn't want to vent those manholes. Somebody could get a, a heel stuck in those manholes. So every one that we possibly can, we will vent. 
and when? Well, we did six of them today, okay. and we'll, we'll continue and get them done as soon as possible. I, I, I generally try to work with businesses, but as soon as possible isn't really, with what we were told on July 1st of 16, mm -hmm. to hear the uh, phrase, as soon as possible, doesn't make me feel very good. Is there anybody out there working right now? They've been working out there on the regular day shifts, replacing the cable out here where, the, where they had the failure. Where they had the failure, the, but the whole stretch needs to be redone. A, you were told us at the time that you, I mean, a whole bunch of it needed to be replaced and, and, you know, it seems, okay, we got through last Friday, now we'll do it as we can get to it. Uh, my, my belief is, I mean, you talk about some of those could be on the sidewalk, uh, a heel could get stuck in them. Some of those could be on the sidewalk, somebody could be standing on it or walking over it and have it blow right up their, their keister. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, urgency by National Grid. Well, with a couple of other things that we have planned, um, along with a, a recommendation by uh, Commissioner Raleigh to, to look into sensors in the manhole that can determine when there's a, a, a gas buildup and that we would get a notification of that so that we can get to that location before anything happens again. I, I guess what, what worries me and bothers me is phrases like look into, you know, phrases like dislodge. It doesn't seem to be any sense of urgency or care that this could, be, we could have a death here. Mm -hmm. If somebody happens to be walking in the wrong spot or driving in the wrong spot, we could have a death. And, uh, you know, if we looked at what happened in the, with mm -hmm. the gas company up in the Merrimack Valley this past year, and again, it's a different, different situations, but I don't think National Grid wants to have any deaths on, on their hands. Mm -hmm. Why don't we, why don't we see 20, 30, 40 crews down here working on this with a sense of emergency. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we need to have a judge declared an emergency? The fire chief has just left. I wish he was still here. Is that what we need to have somebody declare an emergency and force you? I mean, I can t tell you that when the next, uh, the next set of hearings for, uh, for rate hikes comes, I'll be in testifying because it's National Grid in the past has been a good partner, I believe, but not, not now. This is dangerous. This is life-threatening, but it doesn't seem to be a, feel like you people think it's a life-threatening situation. Am I wrong? Oh, you're absolutely wrong. Um, well, we show do me. Take it, we do take it very seriously, and, and, and I know it's hard to understand, but with anything that we do, there's the back room that has to take place, and that's the engineering. It has to be engineered properly. We have to design it properly. We have to obtain easements from the city of Brockton so that we can stop placing the We'll equipment. stay here all night and uh, give you all the easements you want. Yes. We're, we're working through them right now. We've got uh, um, item number eight tonight is for an easement for a new business at 121 Main Street. We're going to put a pad mount transformer. That person, that I'm sorry, that business will not be served off of the the network it'll go on the radio system anything new that comes into the downtown goes on the radio system we've engineered we're planning we're developing how we're changing out everything to to the radio loop fed system and where does that engineering take place uh, i'm sorry where does that engineering department um kathy castro is the manager of engineering could she step up for a minute please sure. Thank you for being here. Would like to know, so you're the, the head of that department? I'm the manager of the department, yeah. Is this the number one priority in the department? It is one of the number one priorities. We actually have underground engineering specialists that have been working on putting, on a, putting together a comprehensive plan <laughs> to actually eliminate, eliminate the system and re-electrify the whole area. Um, the plan is going to be, um, well, it's, we've kicked it off, so it's a five-year plan, and we've actually started the detailed engineering to um, get rid of that 1930s paper and lead cable that um, is the <coughs> suspect for the, these issues um, and replace them with a, uh, a, a rubber or plastic cable, which pre will prevent these issues from happening. You can understand my, again, I, one of the priorities, one of the, you know, dislodge kind of, it seems like, so one of the priorities, I guess, is better than not being one of the priorities, but I'd like to see it be the number one priority that that's what your, your people, if, if somebody, if my fire chief were to walk into your engineering department tomorrow, that he'd be able to see 
that it's the number one priority you're working on. Again, life and death situation. And, and this is not, the, I mean, it was a life and death situation back in July of 16, mm -hmm. and, but we didn't know it. You came to us as a company and said, we're gonna fix this. And clearly, there was some, fi there was some work done, but clearly not enough Explore. urgency, and it became one of those things that uh, we'll get to it as we go. So no, and we do understand that. And over the last couple of years, we've had we have invested about 1.3 million to replace um, a lot of that cable. Um, in addition, we've made investments to install <coughs> vented manhole covers, like Joe has said. Um, there's other projects outside of the comprehensive plan that are in place to go into construction that are about half a million dollars worth of infrastructure upgrades. Um, and the plan itself is about a $7.2 million project that will replace this aged cable. $7.2 million project, and in your planning, how long is that $7.2 million project supposed to take? Right now, it's um, scheduled to take over five years to, to complete. About four and a half too many. Yeah. So, and, and just to explain, it's, it's complex. <laughs> um, this is a network system. So the, it, it's, it's multiple primary circuits feeding multiple transformers, feeding secondaries that are all intertied together. Um, there has to be like a sequential order to actually um, eliminate the, those secondaries and turn it into what Joe was saying, a radial um, preferred alternate service to, the, to this downtown area. Well, thank you, and I, you know, I hate to sound like a <coughs> stick in the mud, but not happy with where we are right now. <coughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you th for coming up this evening. I had filed a resolve that would be read next week to have National Grid come in front of us. Um, I myself spoke when you were recently out here, not yourselves, but others, um, about rate hikes, and I thought, well, this is not a really good time. Uh, to even bring that up. But uh, but the concern here is, uh, as uh, some of our colleagues had mentioned on Friday, after this explosion, people didn't have you know their power naturally and people couldn't get their work done, et cetera. I mean, this is a hub. This is one of the largest cities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So it seems, as my colleague has suggested, that this should be more of a priority. This is a city with about 100,000 people. It's the fourth largest school system. And we have three hospitals here. So this is, how would I say it, a place that is, is um, you know, humming along and uh, can't have an explosion to jeopardize the safety of other people <laughs> and also to block our streets when people need to get through to these hospitals, to these schools, and um, to our uh, college. So that, um, I sincerely hope that maybe, how would I say, things can be uh, further expedited for our residents and for the businesses in this community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Powell. Yeah, a couple of ca technical questions. What, what causes the gas to form? What, what, is, what is being oxidized or burned or what, what causes that? In this case, the lead cable, there was, um, I, I guess you could, it falls within the cable and that will produce that gas. So um, it's, a, it's a cable defect? Yes, it's, the cable itself is 1930s vintage cable, um, which is, has lasted us a long time. Um, but it's just reached its, its towards its end of its life. So What causes the ignition so that there's an explosion? Well, as the gas is created and then any, the cable will start to fault and any type of spark can cause the manhole cover to dislodge. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to beat up on either one of you, but I thought the last time this happened, mm -hmm. someone said that you were going to strip out all the old cable, and I did not get the impression that that was going to take, you know, five years. So picking up on something my colleague said, um, you know, when we have a hurricane, sometimes we're without power, but you, you do call in all these different crews from all over the country, and it just seems to me you do have more resources mm -hmm. available to you that I think could be brought to bear on this because uh, you know, if it happened once, that would be one thing. It happens twice, that's another thing, but you know, it's kind of like three times you're out. Yeah. Yeah, and we understand that, so we actually have started, we're, re we're re-looking at the plan and trying to see where we can compress it and accelerate it. Okay, and uh, uh, I'll strike that. Let's, let's, if we have to, we'll have you come back. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Cardinal, you've always been great to work with over the years. And I think what you said, Joe, is today you, you vented six of these manholes. Is that right? Six? Uh, they, they added six more vented manholes today. Okay. So, so is, if we do numbers, would that be 30 a week we can bank on you do out of the 140? Do we have those, Mark, in, in stock? Yeah. yeah, we do. What's that? Is that right, numbers, 30 a week you're going to do? And so out of that 140, 142, somewhere on the sidewalk, how, how many, what's that number? What's the total number you need to vent is what I'm trying to find. So if we're basing on six a day. Can you step forward to the? Uh, I'm, I'm Mark Dombrowski, I'm the manager of Underground Lines. Um, there, is some, there is some potential issues with venting all the manholes as well. Um, because of the fact that you know, the, we use salt, water, debris gets down in the vented holes that we have, and sometimes that can even deteriorate the cable quicker. So we want to be careful where we vent the holes. So we can't, we can't vent every single hole because that would just be <coughs> adding fuel to the fire. You know what I mean? So we're trying to pick strategic locations that would possibly put a, put a vented manhole cover in between two or three manholes so that any gas buildup along that street or along that duct line will vent out that one vent and it will protect the other cable. So if you're doing, like you did six today, Joe said, when will that be completed? The six that would- No, 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 like if you're basing on 140 and you're doing it every couple, right, because of the salt right. and all that, when will that be done? Uh, we're gonna continue on every day for- No, but you must have a drop I, dead date. I would say, I would say over the next three weeks we'll have all the vented covers. And is in. that just regular working hours or are you doing overtime? That's regular working hours. Yeah, that's where we probably have a little problem. Because we've been very, very fortunate no one's seriously injured. And if I could, if I could speak to the, one of the comments about bringing in outside crews and everything like we do in a storm, this is an absolutely totally different system than the overhead system where we can bring outside <coughs> contractors in and work on it. This is a network system, so it's always alive. It's, it's yep. never dead, okay? When we bring outside contractors in, the lines are down, they're dead, they're on the ground. They're just basically picking them up and putting them back on poles. This is a network system that has to be worked alive. And it's, and it's, 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 it's a very, it's a robust system, but it's, it's, it's dangerous to our workers as well because of the fact they have to handle everything within the manhole alive while they work it, Right. okay? Um, but can you, can you go to a manhole right now on Montello Street, hold something to it and say there's gas build up there? No. Nothing at all? No. Wow. No. The gas only builds up when the cable fault actually occurs. Okay. What happens is you have a copper cable. It's a piece of wire that runs inside of an insulation, which is paper, and it's impregnated with oil. That's how it was made. And those cables were fantastic cables. They lasted for hundreds of, hundreds of years, right? Um, when that oil starts to um, degrade and starts to uh, dry out, the papers become, instead of insulated, they become brittle. And the cables cycle, they move in a manhole. They have different cycle times. While, while the cables are in the manhole, they, there's very subtle movement to them. That breaks down the insulation papers on that old type of cable. The insulation starts to get brittle, and what happens is the voltage that's running on the inside cable inside of that insulation, it's always trying to get out to ground. You've always heard about ground and, and electricity. Mm -hmm. It's always trying to get out to ground. Well, the lead covering on that cable is a ground. That's how it was manufactured, and that's how it is all over the country, uh, paper and lead cable. The problem is, is when that paper starts to degrade and it starts to get brittle with age, um, it becomes mm -hmm. brittle and it, it wants to let a little of that voltage through to ground, and that starts arcing inside the cable and it starts breaking down the lead insulation, the lead insulation finally fails and that's when you start getting sparks. When you start getting that burning and that sparking, that's what creates the gas. So what we're trying to do right now, we're bringing it, we're, we're, we're purchasing 12 units. Um, it's, a trial, it's a trial unit, uh, Con Ed down in New York City uses these. Um, they just started using them. We're buying 12 of them to install in Brockton at different that's, locations. That's what Larry Rowley, the commissioner, had recommended? That's correct. It, okay. That's okay. correct. Our, our engineering group had already been looking at them, but it was only a trial in Con Ed. Yep. They went down and saw it. 
They said, you know, it may work for us. We're going to try it out someplace. I called up the engineering department. I said, I know where you can try them. We need them up here in Brockton. Okay. So we're going to be installing 12 of those down in, down in downtown Brockton. And when will that be done? Um, they're on order now. I'm not sure of the time frame when they're going to be in. Probably over the next <coughs> several weeks that, that we should be receiving them. And then from there, um, it's a matter of they install like six in a day. So we'll have, <coughs> within a week, we'll have them all installed once we get them in. Okay. So and then they'll send a cell signal once that, if that gas starts to build up at all, it'll pick up that gas and it sends a cell signal to a, to a monitor that we can monitor and say, hey, we have gas buildup in this section. Yep. Let's get down there, vent it, try to see what's going on before anything gets to a point where it can flash. Okay. Well, it sounds like Council Beauregard is doing a resolve, but what I'm going to respectfully ask is, you're telling me your best guess would be three weeks to get the venting completed. So that would be one. And the other one would be when, <coughs> when the, Con Ed, the Con Ed stuff comes in a few weeks from now. So I'm going to ask every week if you could give the president an update mm -hmm. and then he can share it with us before Council Beauregard has you. Because, Absolutely. Because we're getting calls from constituents saying, hey, what the heck's going on? Um, mm -hmm. And so we need to have information shared. So I do thank you for your time. The information you gave is, is healthy. But I think, you know, Mr. Cruz hit it on the head. I mean, we're, we're playing kind of, you know, with people's lives here, you know. So we have to, yeah, it's Russian roulette. We got to be careful. But thank you again. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> as you can hear and also see from all of us is that uh, this is a life and death situation. And I understand that you guys are willing to actually go the extra miles. But my question to you, is there any possibility for you guys to bring some more people down there? I mean, I would assume that you do have the manpower to actually do it. Instead of doing six, would it be okay to double it? And if yes, um, when can you start with that? And if no, why? Because, you know, the situation is that, I mean, you claim that you cannot, you cannot do the one on the sidewalk due to certain concern that you have. I can understand that. I have no idea whatsoever in terms of like how this system works, but if there's a possibility to somewhat, you know, increase or s speed it up, um, I would be more than happy to appreciate that because I'm not saying that you guys are not willing to do so, but if there is manpower, I mean, if you have people who are educated enough to actually help advance fixing this issue, uh, why not bring them on board? You see what I mean? So I would greatly appreciate if you can actually think about that. Uh, and I think this will make all of us happy. I mean, I know it's a very a delicate situation. You gotta put people that actually know what they're doing to not cause more problem. But if you can fix this issue as soon as possible, that would be great. You also stated that we will get it done as soon as possible. I'm the kind of guy that likes to know a date and in time, so I'm not gonna ask you to give me a date, but I'm assuming you said two to three weeks. So from now on, today is what? Today is the 20th? So we have like three weeks to go and that problem will be solved. Would that be fair to you guys? The, 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 the vented manhole covers will be installed within three weeks, yes. Okay, so we can absolutely show 100% that part of this problem will be fixed. Well, I can't guarantee you that the problem will be fixed in three weeks. I can tell you that the vented manhole covers will be put in place mm -hmm. within three weeks. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, because it's very hard to predict because we, even when you go out and do a survey, we, we've surveyed the area three times, um, the entire downtown, every manhole, and we take detailed surveys, we take amperage readings on the cables to make sure there's no more amperage that should be in the cables that, that, than there should be. Um, we, we do a visual inspection, we test for gas, um, we do all that stuff in every manhole along the 140 manholes. And every time we've inspected it so far, we haven't found a single, th a single mm -hmm. thing that would be a problem. Um, when we first started it, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. When we first started it, we did find something else and we were able to correct it before anything happened. Okay. But since then, the, other, the, the, the subsequent uh, surveys have, we've, we've found nothing because it can happen, uh, we could survey it today and tomorrow something could start to, to heat up and, and we don't know it. And that's why these, uh, these sensors that we're gonna put in place, we think will help us to be able to capture that. While we're working on the plan to get rid of it all, mm -hmm. these sensors will at least give us some sort of a signal that hey, something's going on and we will respond 24 hours a day, seven days a week to those issues. So that's good. So as we speak, I mean, with, to be honest with you, I was very uneducated about this, you know, this, this, this process. 
uh, until uh, Council Cruz actually made some s statement and you actually give us some very, very good explanations. So given the fact that some of the um, wire that we, you know, we are using now in the city of Brockton um, have been in use for so long, so is it safe actually to actually drive on top of those manholes? Because you said you don't know whether or not, you do not have the capacity to determine whether or not um, one of them is actually leaking the gas. Is it safe for people to drive? It is. Okay. Uh, it, it, we I'm not trying to do any. I'm not trying to do any fee. I'm just asking. No, no, no. We we feel it is only because of the fact that Brockton, Worcester, Providence, all of our territories, including you know other utilities, you know Boston Edison, now Eversource, uh, Con Ed, we all have this vintage cable in the ground. Mm -hmm. We all have them as an underground utility. This is the cable that was put in. 70, 80, 90 years ago, and it's still in service today. It was very good cable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these happen in a very small percentage of the cables that are in the ground. I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of miles of this lead cable. And I know, obviously, three times in, in six years is, is far too many. Yeah. I agree. Um, but when you think about the thousands of, of feet of cable and thousands of miles of cable that's pulled into our, into our duct lines throughout all of the Commonwealth, um, it's a very low percentage of time that anything like that happens. So we feel it's safe. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, just because a cable fails doesn't mean that it blows up a, a manhole cover. We do have failures that we, we, we get calls all the time with somebody's got flickering lights, Somebody's got no power. We go, we, we inspect it, we go in a manhole, aha, we find the problem. There was a mm -hmm. problem. It just didn't get to that level of intensity with the gas buildup. And with the network system, when the network system was put in back 80 years ago, the loads were such in the Brockton area that the cables ran smoothly. Um, now that the, the, the loads are less because, you know, manufacturing is down and different things, it affects the network system. A radial fed system like we're gonna be installing, that doesn't affect it. We, as a matter of fact, the radial system gives us the uh, opportunity to, to bring on new load growth onto the system with, with relative, relative ease. Um, the network system was totally different because you had loads flowing both ways and it had to be certain size cables and you had to have constant load flow on the cables. And when the load flow starts to slow down, it can affect how the fusing, which was there to protect a situation like this. We have what's called limiters in the cable. And when you have a cable failure, what happens is, is it, it starts to, to burn. And when it reaches a certain amperage, the limiters will burn off and, and stop it from burning any further. It won't create any gas or anything. The limiters will burn off. The problem with it is, is that when you're on, an, on the outskirts of a network system and you're not pulling as much amperage as you used to, these limiters are made for heavier loads, and so the cable will start to burn, and it'll start to burn, and it'll keep burning on its own without burning the limiters off, which can create this gas. And we run into it in every city, every major city in the country runs into the same situation. Mm -hmm. well, so that's why a radial system is, is definitely the way to go. Well, I would like to thank all three of you for actually taking your time to uh, giving us wonderful explanation in regard to this issue. And my hope is that um, I do believe you guys will do um, anything possible to fix this issue. So thank you so much for coming down to uh, answer some of our questions. Mr. Chairman, in the spirit of their wonderful explanations, I would say thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Azak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Quick question, and I apologize in advance if it was already asked, but I didn't hear the answer. Has this happened anywhere else besides Brockton? Yes. Where, where? Providence, Rhode Island, Worcester, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, it, it happens basically in every major utility that has underground equipment. They have cable failures just like this. Okay. Um, you know, some, some, you know, they, I mean, if you, if you Google it, you, you'll see all the different okay. utilities across the country it happens to, but unfortunately, you know, you only usually hear about your local area, but it does happen it does in happen. other cities, yes. And um, do we risk it? I know right now in the last, last time it happened, it's mainly downtown. Do we risk it spreading like throughout the city or is it always going to be just mainly? It's where the network system is. is? Okay. And that's, um, I, I, any, any electrical cable can fail. Okay. 
But for the failure to cause that gas buildup we're talking about and, and get to a level where it ignites, that typically happens only in a network secondary system where it, where it has low impedance and it's burning for quite a while and the gas is flowing down duct lines and maybe filling up a manhole with, with that gas. Okay. Um, so that's primarily where, where it would happen. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I believe that's it for questions. Uh, and I, and I, I go back to what Councillor Sullivan said. You've got my card. Yep. You know, please try to keep us in the loop uh, as we go forward with this, because this is a major concern of ours, and we want to work with you as partners as well. But uh, we need to to stay on top of this to make sure that you know this issue is minimized, uh, and we go forward with this stuff. And then I, I believe. We will have, if you don't mind, have you guys come back probably in like six to seven weeks and just give us an overall, um, uh, an update exactly how far we've gotten with this with this issue so that the uh, the residents in the city as well can kind of get a sense of what's going on. Because I think this, although it was not an agenda item, but I felt it was somewhat important for us to. Thank you. I mean, I got educated, Thank you very to be much. honest with you. Thank you. I think we all yeah. did. The, the work could be actually, uh, <laughs> doing the, exp the explaining of this, the situation, <laughs> but I, uh, I, got I got educated, so I, I hope the uh, folks watching us thank at home you. did as well. Thank too, you. So. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Yep. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, number five, Madam Clerk. Approval of the payment of $21,739.08 from Finance Purchase of Services to Nugent Capital for the billing period of December 2016 through January 2017. Invited Tory Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Clarkson, I had, I guess uh, a counselor had said something in the past about these meetings getting longer and longer. So welcome to Brockton. <laughs> Thank you. I think my record when I was in Bridgewater was 2 a.m. in the morning. So <laughs> hey, listen, the budgets are coming. I hope we don't beat that record. Uh, we won't. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. President, counselors. So the, the city has two PPAs, power purchase agreements. We have more, but specifically with this company for solar projects that exist in Swansea and Halifax. So we buy power from those solar projects and so they bill us on a regular basis. Uh, what I'm told happened was that Nugent Capital did an inventory uh, of their billing and realized that they had failed to bill us uh, for a period, as you can see, that's uh, from December 2016 through January 2017. That, of course, is not in this fiscal year, so it requires a vote. Uh, of the council to pay that. Motion to recommend favorably. On, on the motion. motion Council Sullivan. Mr. Claxon, is there any uh, penalty interest incorporated in there since it was so long ago? No, I be, uh, I'll double check that, but I believe, that pretty sure the answer is no, it was their mistake, not Excellent. ours. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Motion has been made. Properly second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, number six, please. Order that pursuant to the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, the City Council authorizes the reauthorization of Comcast Revolving Fund for fiscal year 2020 from the cash receipts from Comcast franchise fees in excess of $675,000 pursuant to the cable license contract, and further, that the expenditures from this fund shall not exceed $750,000 without further appropriation during fiscal year 2020. Invited Honorable Mayor William Carpenter, Tory Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Chairman. Co I would like Council to move that we take number nine out of order and act on it collectively with number six. They are both reauthorizations of revolving accounts involving yeah. Mr. Clarkson. Second. Set. Actually, I have a question on number six. Yeah, I think we might just might as well leave it the way it is for now, and then we'll uh, bang right through it. Okay, I'll withdraw my motion. I withdraw my second. Thank you. Uh, I also got a call from the mayor uh, stating that he feels that Mr. Clarkson will be able to provide the information that we might need a little more, you know, up to where it should be with this uh, appropriation. That's why he and he had something else to uh, do this evening. That's why he's not here. Uh, does somebody want to make? Go ahead, Mr. Thank you. Before I make a motion, just 
I know you haven't been part of the Comcast negotiations in the past, uh, but I would like to ask you as the mayor's representative here tonight, we had, while we were out as wandering minstrels for the last two years, there was some good work done in here. The cameras are 100% better, but I've gotten many complaints about the quality of the sound mm -hmm. at home. If you could, through the mayor's office that handles this account, uh, reach out to, uh, to BCA, who is the beneficiary of most of this money, not all of it, but they tend to be the beneficiary of most of it, to do something to fix that, because the people at home can't understand me, and I speak eloquently all the time. So, <laughs> uh, so if you could just make that request. Well, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Council. Um, I believe I had a conversation with Mr. Lindy about this the other day, and he feels that it's in the Comcast head end. The sound that's coming from us to them is eloquently done, but the issue is with Comcast, not, not necessarily with BCA. Well, through you, Mr. Chairman, if you could then have them reach out to Comcast themselves yes. and uh, tell them it's, un it's unacceptable. Makes sense. Thank uh, you. Councilor Isaac. Um, I also had a conversation with Mark Lindy, and he did suggest that um, there's, of course, channel 912, and he said 98, which could be possibly a little bit clearer. So he did suggest that if people were having a hard time hearing, hearing us, that try channel 98. Okay. Thank you. But still, I, I agree with you. We're, oh, it, it's, the same, it's the same as with all the utilities. It's not free service. And they should fix what they they're collecting money. Exactly. Absolutely. And I agree motion to that. recommend favorably. Yes. Yes. Motion has been properly made in second. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries. Number seven. Ordered annual budget for fiscal year 20. Invited Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Carson. Mr. Clarkson, you're back on. Actually, we'd we'd make a, I'd make a motion to postpone this till the uh, first posted budget uh, budget hearing. Second. This is the actual budget. Is that what it is? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. So I make yeah. a motion to postpone to the budget stage. meeting on June third. Yeah. Motion has been properly made and second. All those in favor of postponement? All those opposed? It shall be postponed until June third. Okay. Number eight. Please. Ordered that the Brockton City Council, acting on behalf of the City of Brockton, does hereby grant an easement to Massachusetts Electric Company. Said underground system is located in, through, under, over, across, and upon a certain parcel of land situated on the easterly side of L Street, being more particularly shown as parcel A, 11,003 square feet, on a plane of land recorded with the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds in Plan Book 23, page 6, 38, 121 Main Street and 28 High Street. Invited Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic Development, Bob Malley, Executive Director of Parking. Mr. I'm May. Back. You're back. How are you? Uh, we hope you will favorably recommend uh, this easement. Uh, it'll allow us to serve uh, the new development at 121 Main Street and uh, the rehabilitation of the uh, Hotel Grayson uh, at some point in the future. Move to recommend favorably. Power. Second. You're not going to use old wiring, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 The, the, the new, new. radio system. <laughs> Motion has been properly made in second. All those in favor? Mm -hmm. All those opposed? So moved. Uh, number nine, Madam Clerk. Ordered that pursuant to the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, the City Council authorizes the reauthorization of Parking Authority Revolving Fund to receive revenue from parking violation fines up to and including the amount of $250,000. Said funds to be expended by the Parking Authority to pay expenses of parking regulation enforcement and repair and maintenance of lots, facilities and equipment, and capital projects. But expenditures for capital projects shall require the written approval both of the Parking Authority Board of Directors and the mayor for fiscal year 2020. Amounts in excess of $250,000 shall be credited to the general fund. Invited Bob Malley, Executive Director of Parking, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Malley, welcome. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> What's up with this? It's a, a, a renewal of the revolving fund. Uh, recommendation back second. To the council. Motion has been properly made in second. All those in favor? Uh, All those opposed? Recommendation carries. Thank you. Thank you. Number 12. 
In compliance with the provisions of the election laws, notice is hereby given that the city preliminary will be held on Tuesday, September 17, 2019, and that the city election will be held on Tuesday, November 5, 2019, at various designated polling places. Invited, Cynthia Scavani, Executive Director, Elections. Favorable sure. recommend. Second. Second. <laughs> yeah. A motion has been properly made and second. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries. Councils, I think uh, we have reached the uh, the end of the road. Yeah. It's been a, a little long today, but we had quite a few items on the agenda. Is there any? Darren Court. Uh, Mr. President, may I have a moment of personal privilege, hey, please? Sir. Thank you. Keep um, it I would short. like to. Keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I would like to uh, remind my colleagues about our Haitian flag days tomorrow. Small, Unfortunately, yeah. uh, we had to cancel uh, last Friday due to the weather. Uh, but I but I believe tomorrow morning will be excellent, and I would like to see all of my colleagues. And the time is um, 9.30 to 12. Um, we're going to have some um, our amazing kids from Brockton High School uh, coming down to play for us. And you can uh, expect uh, a very beautiful uh, city hall by having a bunch of children playing for us tomorrow at City Hall. So I'll encourage all of my colleagues, please come down and celebrate part of our culture. Thank you, Mr. Jim. That's a record. You know, uh, Councillor Yenier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick uh, moment of personal uh, privilege, if I might. There's just two items I just want to make mention. I did mention to you last week that uh, tomorrow night at the school committee meeting, uh, Councillor Stadinsky will be receiving the Louis F. Angelo Award if anyone is free and wishes to come by at 7 o'clock p.m. in the uh, Rom Little Theater to do so. I'll be presenting him um, with that award tomorrow evening. A week from Wednesday on May the 29th, there'll be a Ward 3 meeting from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at the Kennedy School. Again, it'll be Wednesday evening, May 29th, 6.30 to 8 p.m. At, uh, at the Kennedy School. We'll have some uh, guests there, and it's uh, like an open forum, so anyone wants to come and beat me up, here's your chance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor. Councilor Cruz? Thank you. Just want to take a moment of uh, personal privilege and ask for a moment of silence. Uh, city Wiring Inspector Wally Belchun has passed away this past weekend. Uh, great guy, quiet guy, and uh, uh, great city employee. So just ask for a moment of silence. Thank you. May we rest in peace. Uh, hey. Councilor Azek. A moment of personal privilege. You may, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, I was. Uh, uh, this past weekend with some of my colleagues, I was able to um, be a judge at the uh, spelling bee that is uh, put out citywide. And um, I was going to announce the names of all the winners this evening, but due to the time, <laughs> I won't do that to you. So I would just like to congratulate all the participants, all the schools, um, all the winners, and of course, uh, the administration. They did, um, it was very well done. and. Um, even though it wasn't the Little Red Schoolhouse, uh, it was uh, it was still it went off really well, and um, I guess it was spelling B um, 2.0, so it was nice. Yeah, Council Sullivan and I uh, were yes, there you as judged well. in the <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> and I'll tell you, those kids are a lot smarter than we are. Yeah. <laughs> Council of Oregon. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, for a moment of personal privilege okay, here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, everyone that was part of Mass Memories. That was uh, counselors. Some of you made it, and uh, all you know, run by volunteers. Pretty neat uh, to put down uh, people's you know feelings, remember memories of this city. Uh, kind of nice uh, touch to our history, which leads me to mention that we have yet to see the appointees of the historical commission. And in this municipal school facility study and master plan, there's many references to historical buildings or the preservation of such historical buildings. And um, it just seems if we had a historical commission, that might be moving along in the right direction. And I, you know, I believe that all of us want sincerely to see the police and the fire get what they deserve. And of course, many of us question because the streets need to be paved. There's no going around that. But this didn't just happen overnight. I mean, we had press predecessors that might have, you know, thought about addressing some of these situations so they wouldn't be so costly at present. And also, I believe that quite frankly, when an extensive amount of research goes into such a 
project study, that it should be available to the public, whether it be online or in hard copy through the library system, because people have a right to know about all these proposals and you know what the, the, the plans are and the way this, this city looks at the future. And the last part of this is, yes, we want to see our you know, fire and, and police have you know, a nice new building or buildings, but right now it seems that a lot of our concentration on, is on helping the other communities service some of the individuals that they really can't service in their communities and maybe we should start thinking about, um, I don't know, charging some people for some of the services we provide so maybe we'd have some of the money we need for what we would like like upgraded fire department and police and schools, et cetera. So anyway, just worth mentioning. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor, I just want to make sure that we're reminded that next Monday is, the, is Memorial Day. It's a One, there's a beautiful parade here in the city that we should all participate. Uh, it's a good walking, <laughs> you know, stretch out the old uh, tummy, but at the same time that we will not be here on Monday, <laughs> but we will be here on Tuesday and we're asked to come a little early at 6.30 and dressed in the best attires that we actually have with some makeup for our annual, biannual <laughs> photo opportunity here in the council chambers. Hearing no further business of the city council of the people of Brockton, here we are adjourned. Thank you, Thank you sir. Yeah.